My son's imaginary friend had legs that bent the wrong way, like the crooked legs of a bird. He said that every time his imaginary friend walked, the bones would poke out through the skin, yet he was able to move at inhumanly fast speeds, like a character in a video that had been played on Fast Forward. My son had named this creepy friend Mr. Graham. Needless to say, I found his new imaginary friend to be a trifle upsetting. When I told my wife about it, she said that it wasn't just upsetting, but absolutely disturbing in every way imaginable. Why do his bones have to do that? She asked me. That seems like fairly inappropriate imagery for a five-year-old. Maybe it is some subconscious projection for some accident that he saw on TV. I said thoughtfully. She rolled her eyes at this. I don't think they show that stuff with their bones sticking out on Nickelodeon, she said sarcastically. But we let it go and continued on with our lives as normal. Johnny continued to talk about Mr. Grimm and the adventures that they went on, and we kind of just got used to it. After all, children have vivid imaginations and I wasn't the type to read into things too much. As a parent, I knew sometimes that you just had to go with the flow and let them develop on their own. That was before pets started going missing in our neighborhood. The entire street became covered in missing posters for local cats and dogs. None of their bodies were ever found. I didn't know what to think about it, so I just didn't. I just continued to go to work and spend time with my wife and enjoy life as much as I could. I would take Johnny out on weekend outings to amusement parks or nature trails. But one time when we were hiking together, he said something rather disturbing to me. Mr. Grimm says he knows what happens to the kitties and puppies, he told me. I looked down at him sharply. Johnny, that's not funny, I said. There are some sick people out there, people who do things to animals for no reason. There are people out there that do those things to kids too for no reason. That's why your mom and I always tell you to avoid strangers and never get in a car with anyone besides your family. And you shouldn't joke about the missing puppies and kitties. But dad, he said, I wasn't joking. Mr. Grimm said he took the puppies and kitties with him to his playground. He said that I can come with him one day too. He says that no one hurts puppies or kitties there, or little kids. He said that we all live forever with him. And that he never lets us go because he loves us all too much and wants to be with us forever. I looked down at his small, serious face, waves of dread rising inside my stomach. Johnny, Mr. Grimm isn't real, I said. He's just an imaginary friend. And that means that he comes from your own mind, just like your dreams. They might feel real, but they're all inside of you. He just shook his head at this like he couldn't believe how slow his old dad was. You'll see soon, daddy, he said. Mr. Grimm is as real as you and me. Maybe even realer because he says that he's been here a long, long time. He says he remembers the roads before there were any cars on them, back when they were all dirt. He said he remembers when horses and donkeys were the only way around. He told me about it. It's pretty weird to think about, daddy, how old he really is. I didn't know that people could live that long. Johnny, if Mr. Grimm was a real person and what you said was true, he would have to be over 130 years old. No one has ever lived that long and it is impossible. Don't get carried away with this Mr. Grimm stuff because not everyone will understand like your mom and I do. Some people might think that it's a little bit weird. That was the end of the conversation and we continued hiking in silence. I was deep in thought, wondering about all the strange things that my son had said. The next day, kids started disappearing. It started with the Crabtree boy the next street over. From what I heard, he was playing in his backyard in a sandbox. His mother would look out the window every minute or so while she did the dishes. And then she looked up and he was gone. His toys still in the same spot. His little blue baseball cap upside down in the spot where he had been sitting. Mrs. Crabtree sprinted out, looking around frantically and screaming his name, but he was just gone. No sign of any strangers in the neighborhood. No suspicious cars. 
No random leads caught by stoplight cameras or doorbell cameras, so ubiquitous in our little suburban neighborhood. There weren't even any footprints in the sandbox, neither the boys nor anyone else's, except for the tracks that led to the middle of the sandbox where he had been sitting and playing. It was as if he had been raptured up into heaven in the space of 60 seconds. The police searched for weeks for that little boy, even using helicopters to search the endless woods that started at the north edge of town. Volunteers from around our county joined in, combing every square inch of woods within miles, diving into local lakes and checking abandoned buildings and sewers near the child's house. There wasn't a sign of him anywhere. It was as if he had just vanished in the flash of an eye. After weeks of no news, the attention paid to it slowly started to die down. People forgot about the grieving parents and the missing child, like they always would in these types of situations. I was extremely busy at work doing research into quantum entanglement and quantum computers at our state university. My wife had left to go spend time with her father, who had dementia and cancer and very suddenly took a turn for the worse. So I ended up having to take Johnny to work. I didn't really mind as he was a good boy who listened and very rarely got in trouble. The Mr. Grimm thing was the only weird part of his young personality, but other than that, he was a fast learner. Respectfully, he acted in many ways like a child much older than himself. We entered the quantum research laboratory, his little hand holding mine tightly as he stared around with wide blue eyes. It smelled like cleaning chemicals and burning metal throughout the entire chamber emanating even out into the hallways of the university building. My son wrinkled his tiny nose, making a comically cute face as he did so. I handed him a pair of safety glasses, putting one on myself before he started up with his usual childlike questioning. Daddy, why does it smell like that? He asked me and I shrugged. Oh, it's a lot of machines that consume huge amounts of power. I explained simply to him. This single building can consume as much power as hundreds of houses like ours. Some of this stuff, I indicated with a wave of my hand, showing the gleaming circular vats and the massive metal tubes, the dozens of computer monitors, the tables with entire arrays of green lasers focused on tiny chips, is so cutting edge that we haven't found a way to make it use less electricity yet. It can entangle physical particles or make computers that can do certain processes millions of times faster than conventional computer. Most young children wouldn't be able to comprehend the depth of statements like that. But Johnny wasn't a usual kid. His mind worked incredibly fast and his vocabulary seemed much more developed than a normal five-year-old. Okay, Johnny said simply, letting go of my hand so that I could go hang up our coats and put a little plastic bag of food in the fridge. It was late past dinner time on a Friday and so the entire lab was already deserted. I was one of the few physicists who did much of his work at night when all the equipment was open and I the entire building to myself. On nights like this I could play classical music on its highest volume and just be myself. I started playing an mp3 on one of the many monitors around the lab and then I began to move around and switch all the equipment on. My son sat in the corner using colored pencils to draw while I worked. Tonight, I was using AI to try to increase quantum entanglement from just a few particles to a small diamond. Having turned all the cameras and monitoring equipment on, I activated the processor and watched all the lasers move in unison on the nearby laboratory table, now pointing at the diamond that I had set in the middle of the setup. Johnny looked up as the computers all grew louder. I motioned for him to come close to show him the most interesting part of the entire experiment. A humming, vibrating noise began to spread throughout the floor as the argon lasers became too bright to look at. I put an arm around Johnny, reassuring him. Suddenly, something began to go terribly wrong. The humming vibrations, which had been wave-like and measured, and now began to come in chaotic pulsing waves, knocking equipment off the tables. The argon lasers began to falter and move out of position, burning holes in the tables and walls. An enormous crash of rending metal and glass came from behind me, and I quickly jumped on Johnny, tackling him to the floor and protecting him with my own body until it would all be over. 
as another computer station fell over, sending shards of glass flying that sliced into my left arm, leaving large droplets of red on the floor next to us. The power finally went out and we were submerged in blackness. All I could hear now was Johnny's heavy breathing mixed with my own. And then suddenly I heard the skittering of footsteps as something large coming from my right. Is it over? Johnny asked in a trembling voice. I think so, kiddo. I said reassuringly, getting off of him and slowly standing up in the pitch dark. I fumbled in my pockets for my cell phone, turning on the flashlight app and shining it around. At first, I saw only destruction. Smashed monitors, smoking computers, and massive holes everywhere. I thought to myself how lucky we were that the whole place hadn't gone up in flames. As I kept turning though, I saw something far more horrific. A small boy stood in the corner with black and stringy hair. His skin looked drained of color, white as a vampire's, and red constantly bubbled out of his mouth, sliding down his chin in streaks. He wore the ragged remains of what might have been a plaid shirt and jean shorts, but they were all so bloody and torn that it was impossible to tell. His bare legs were bent the wrong way and he started to walk towards me slowly like a bird, his knees bending backwards. The bones stuck out through his shins, calves, and thighs, and as he walked, a nauseating cracking sound echoed around the room, like bone loudly crushing and breaking against other pieces of itself. Now you're there, he said in a deep and gurgling voice. My name, as you surely know, is Mr. Grimm. I'm a friend of your son's and I hope soon a friend of yours. I stood there speechless, shining my light on this abomination. He bowed slightly and waved his thin bony arm around the room. Sorry for the destruction, but I didn't take any means to materialize and the massive amounts of energy in this room was able to give me the physical form I needed. I couldn't keep on as some minor poltergeist. He laughed at the spraying tiny droplets of blood on the floor in front of him as he did so. I didn't see the humor in it. Look, I said putting my hands up as if I were dealing with a rabid dog. I'm sorry for any misunderstanding, but you need to go back to where you came from. This is not okay. My son and I cannot have a... What was he exactly, a monster, a demon? Mr. Grimm waved away my objections with a flick of his hand. That isn't up to you, Jack. You cannot send me back, and if you try to stop me, I'll destroy your son in front of you, and then I will take you out too. My son's little hand tightened on me, and I felt him trembling behind me. Daddy, I'm scared. He whispered to me in a low voice. I want to go home. I know, Johnny, I said quietly. I do too. But what could I do? I had no gun and I wasn't sure if this thing could even be hurt anyway. At that moment, the backup generators kicked down and the laboratory was filled with the glow of red emergency lights. Alright, I said, reaching a decision. My son and I are leaving. Do not follow us. I decided to call 911 and let the professionals deal with this. Maybe they could call on the National Guard. I thought with a small smile. They could fill this thing full enough of full auto weapons fire to leave him looking like Swiss cheese. Ah, Mr. Grimm said. I'm sorry, but I need your son. He smiled at me, an eerie, ear to ear grin that showed all of his bloody teeth and the countless sores on his blackened gums. I used a lot of energy materializing and I need food. I will let you live, however, Jack. His smile widened as if he were offering me some kind of present. Just leave the boy, get in your car and drive home and you can live a full life. As he spoke, I got an idea. We were much closer to the door than Mr. Grimm. I quickly dropped my phone in my pocket, picked up a large computer and I hurled it at Mr. Grimm's broken legs. I heard a demonic cry of pain, his voice sounding like dozens of voices crying at once in a disharmonious shriek. Ignoring it, I picked up Johnny and I ran outside the lab. The door had a number pad on it and I pressed the top button and began rotating the thumb turn away from the hinges, locking the thick wooden door just as something heavy crashed into it on the other side. The knob turned furiously, but it wouldn't budge without the correct numerical code. Okay, that should buy us some time. 
I said quietly, grabbing Johnny's hand and running out through the red emergency lights. The laboratory began erupting in a cacophony of breaking equipment as I called 911, informing them of an intruder and telling them the man was likely armed and dangerous. And then I got Johnny to my car and we sped out of there. My adrenaline still high, my heart beating hard in my chest. The police ended up finding the laboratory destroyed but empty. As the days went on, I wondered if the entire thing was some sort of shared delusion. But then kids started disappearing from our town and the surrounding towns at an alarming rate. I bought a gun for protection and my neighbors and I began to do a local neighborhood watch. One time while I was out patrolling in the middle of the night, I saw that thing again, Mr. Graham. I could tell that it was him instantly from the way that he walked. The crunching of shattered bones and the superhuman speed as he disappeared into the backyard of a nearby house. I followed him quietly, checking that the safety and my gun was turned off. I saw a child exiting the back door of his house as Mr. Grin crept into the bushes. The child looked hypnotized, his eyes totally blank. Mr. Grimm waved his hands and clicked his tongue and a small spark of light in the middle of the backyard expanded to show a massive and brightly colored playground. Even though it was night here on the playground, it was daytime, and I saw countless kids in it. Some of them were hanging from the monkey bars. Others were buried alive up to their heads in the sandbox. He had even crucified a few on the wooden beams of the playset, nailing their hands and feet together. And they all had their mouths opened in a shared and silent scream as the hypnotized child walked quietly towards the vision. No, stop. I said, raising my gun at to point it directly at Mr. Graham. He snarled like a rabid dog at me, beginning to run at me with his superhuman speed. His bent legs snapping and popping and I fired. His head exploded in a shower of black, the smell of decomposing meat filling the air. Behind him, the vision slowly closed back into a pinprick of light and then went out entirely. I called the police, telling them the truth, keeping an eye on the strange and demonic body of Mr. Grimm as I did so. It wasn't the police that ended up showing up, but some secretive federal agent that quickly took possession of the body and swore me to secrecy, giving me a check for 100 k in exchange for signing an NDA that stated I would never tell anybody about the supernatural events that had occurred in the last few weeks. I gladly took the check and signed the document. After all... Who would believe me? My addiction had spiraled out of control for years and I had progressed from breaking into cars to robbing people at ATMs, stealing from dealers or waiting in dark alleys for late partiers to pass by. I had never had an issue with the generally incompetent and understaffed cops around here. And while the police had my general description, I always used a mask and they didn't know exactly who was committing this crime spree. The night that it happened started like any other. I had shot up and nodded off for a few hours and then woke up broken penniless like usual. I casually walked to an area frequented by college students, filled with bars and too many guys and girls living off of daddy's money, and I waited behind a dumpster. My Ruger tucked under my leather belt. I could see my breath in the air and my hands and feet were freezing. The winters here were brutal and without the uh, drugs I needed to live. I felt even worse, cold, shaky and anxious. I wanted to get this over with quickly. Get some money and go back to the motel that I was renting to call my connect. I first saw the man by accident. As I heard a car pass in by the nearby road and peeked my head out to make sure that it wasn't a cop. If somebody nearby had seen me hiding behind this dumpster waiting, they might call the cops out of spite. But it was just some pickup truck, his headlights illuminating the silhouette of a man walking towards me. He wore an expensive suit, his hair professionally styled with gel, a heavy gold chain hanging off his neck. He looked like he was in his late 40s, but still had a strong and chiseled frame. As soon as he got close, I jumped out of my hiding spot, pulling the gun up. 
His eyes didn't even widen in surprise. He didn't yell out, he just smiled at me. His blue eyes flicking from my gun to my face covered in a surgical mask, and then focusing in on my eyes. Empty your pockets now, I said, gesturing with the gun at his pants. No problem, friend, he said in a low and guttural tone. You can have it. He pulled out his wallet and he gave it to me. I patted his pockets, but that was all that he had on him. It was strange to see someone who didn't even carry a phone. Not that I would be likely to steal the phone as they have GPS, but I would at least smash it so that he couldn't immediately call the police as soon as I let him go. Just make sure you don't bite off more than you can chew. He said to me cryptically, his smile widening. His eyes looked too black even for the darkness of the alleyway, and his smile seemed to stretch wider than humanly possible. I raised the gun instinctively, stepping backwards and never taking my eyes off of him. Yet somehow I felt like he was the one with the power and he seemed to have no fear or anxiety despite the circumstances of our meeting. It looked as if he thought the gun would do no damage to him. Once I was near the end of the other way, I tucked the gun back into my waistband and started sprinting down the street. I got back to my motel a few blocks away in record time, running into the room and locking it behind me. I pulled out the wallet and began to examine it. It had no ID, no credit cards, not even a library card. All it had was $400 bills which looked like they were brand new and not even creased in the slightest and a one-way bus ticket to some place called Naraka. I immediately turned most of the money into drugs and ended up nodding off in the bed with the TV set to old reruns of The Twilight Zone. Having nightmares of that man's eyes turning black in the alleyway as he watched me with evil joy, toying with me like a cat's toy with a mouse before it murders it and rips it apart. I knew I had to leave the area soon. Things were getting hot and police were being dispatched into areas that I liked to frequent. Undercover informants were trying to find information on who was behind the string of robberies and burglaries in the city. And I was afraid every time I left my hotel room that I would be rushed by an entire SWAT team and locked away for decades. But by some miraculous stroke of luck, I was left alone. I stopped all criminal activity that weekend, however. I had pushed myself as far as I wanted to, and I was determined to restart my life. I went to a nearby clinic and bought a couple dozen bottles from some of the desperate users standing outside, and telling myself that I would wean myself completely off within a few weeks by taking small sips of it every few hours to take the edge off of the worst of the thralls. I read the one-way ticket that I had stolen from the man. It stated that it was good for any date and that I could get to the city of Naraka by bus. I called the number on the back of it and a robotic voice told me that a bus was scheduled to leave for Naraka at 9am the next morning on some seldom used one-way street next to the state capitol building downtown. After packing up my meager belongings and my last few hundred dollars, I got a few hours of sleep doing the last of what I had left before throwing away all my needles and paraphernalia. By the next morning at 8.30am, I was waiting on the deserted side street, listening to music on my phone wearing multiple jackets and a couple shirts to try to keep the cold away. But the first fingers of withdrawal were beginning to affect me by the time that the bus had pulled up. I felt like somebody was dripping ice water down my back and spine, goosebumps popping up all over my skin so badly that they hurt, a rising sense of anxiety and fear about the impending withdrawals rising in my chest. I was afraid and wondered whether I was making the right decision. The bus was totally empty except for the driver. It didn't look like any bus that I had ever seen. It was painted in bright shiny red paint with seven pointed stars of all colors covering the exterior. A set of scales next to the logo which read, Made Transportation Co. 
The driver looked like he was from the 50s with a highly polished leather round cap, an old style suit and leather shoes to boot. He looked down at me with icy blue eyes, his expression cold and unreadable. May I see your ticket, sir? He asked in an emotionless voice, reaching out his hand towards me. I hesitated for a moment and then pulled the one-way ticket from my pocket. He looked down at it, frowning and looked back at me. All right, let's go, he said. I quickly got on the bus and went to the back, grateful for the rush of warm air as I did so. I took a couple of sips of what I had taken, still out of it from barely getting any sleep the night before, and before I knew it, I had fallen asleep. When I awoke, the bus was totally packed. A little girl sat next to me dressed in an old-fashioned blue dress, tiny blue bows wrapped through her hair and her little blue eyes staring up at me with curiosity. I groggily turned my attention to the rest of the bus and it looked like the bus had stopped at a United Nations conference after I fell asleep. There were men with glasses and briefcases talking quietly in a foreign language. A few rail-thin men with countless scars, red bandanas, and no shirts. A few women with dyed hair and more piercings than I could count, who looked like they had been pulled out of a nearby bar, and much more besides. I felt absolutely terrible like I always did when I woke up and was withdrawing. Freezing cold waves ran through my body and my eyes were watery and my nose wouldn't stop dripping. My stomach was doing flips and goosebumps stood out all over my arms and legs as the withdrawals crashed into my mind with intensity. Ah, darkness, my old friend, I thought to myself. Are you going to Naraka? The little girl beside me asked in a low voice. I turned my bleary eyes down at her. You don't look like you belong, at least not yet. One day soon, I think you'll be ready, if you don't change the path that you're on. I'm going anywhere but here, I said to her. Where are your parents, anyway? My parents, she said softly, looking down at her lap. They're gone. I killed them. I rolled my eyes. Sure, I said. That's not a very good joke, little girl. My name is Zaneda, not little girl, she said, smiling up at me. Harry, I said, shaking her small and soft hand. I looked down, thinking that I should take another sip to try to get rid of the worst of the withdrawals, and I realized that my backpack was gone. I immediately freaked out, looking around frantically, my heart feeling like it would burst out of my chest. I couldn't go cold turkey. Like most addicts, I was absolutely terrified of cold turkey withdrawals and the endless weeks of insomnia and nightmarish intensity of the symptoms. Where's my backpack? I asked loudly. No one looked at me besides Zaneda. Most of the passengers on the bus had totally ignored me, acting like I didn't exist. A girl with dozens of piercings and a face tattoo looked over at me and frowned, shaking her head. I don't know, Zaneda said, smiling slightly and shrugging. It wasn't there when I got in at my stop. Well, it was something important in it. I shook my head violently. You have no idea, I said. This whole trip felt like more and more of a mistake. Next stop, Veriden. A voice echoed throughout the bus. The bus started slowing down and as I looked out the windows, I realized that I wasn't in Kansas anymore. The world outside had huge, tree-like molds growing everywhere. They were fiery red with jet black streaks and grew hundreds of feet tall, like the fungi equivalent of redwoods in this new land. I saw humanoid beings walking on trails that wound through the forests of fungi, their legs bending backwards as they crept forward like birds. They stood at 20 feet tall with deathly pale skin, like some worm from a cave that was never seeing the light of day, and they wore black suits on their thin skeletal bodies. 
Most disconcertingly, their faces were totally blank, without eyes or mouths or noses or hair, just perfectly smooth as skin. They walked by in twos and threes and I saw some of the passengers of the bus get out and begin following the trails traveled by the strange creatures. Am I tripping right now? I said mostly to myself. I tried to remember if I might have been dosed with psychedelic drugs without my knowledge. If somebody might have put drops of LSD in my water bottle or food. But I couldn't remember any opportunity that anybody would have had to drug me. I had certainly had enough experience with psychedelics. And this almost felt like something from the DMT world. The bus slowly began driving forward again. The businessmen who had departed and the faceless beings in front of them fading out of view. The forest thinned out and on the horizon I saw a floating city. Spiraling silver spires without any visible windows or doors were interspersed with massive statues and domed spiky houses with the most disconcerting Lovecraftian appearance. The metal streets of the floating city looked thousands of feet wide. The structures and skyscrapers disappearing into the white puffy clouds of the sky. And then we were off again, entering a black tunnel. I could see nothing outside the bus now. Next stop, Naraka. The emotionless voice sounded. A gasp of horror rolled through the bus as some of the passengers in front started weeping or praying. No, please no. One of the men sat in the seat in front of me, before putting his face in his hands and crying. We exited the seemingly endless black tunnel coming into a horrifying world. The streets were paved with bone and it seemed like they were encased in a metal container thousands of feet tall. The smell of smoke and burning meat had entered the bus, and as I looked around, I saw countless people stretching all the way to the horizon. They ran constantly, most of them without clothes. Their skin burning as fire seemed to sprout from the ground itself. It came out everywhere except for the roads, flames rising a couple feet in the air and sending off thick black clouds that rushed in the strong breeze inside the massive container. To my left, only a hundred feet away, I saw a crying man on his knees in front of a blue-skinned being. The being looked like a tall man in most ways, except for his luminous skin and bulging black eyes. As I looked past him, I saw countless more of the blue humanoids. They appeared to be in charge here and seemed unaffected by the fires, the heat, or smoke around them. Those are the Naraka Navas, Zeneda said to my right, peering out the window dispassionately. Look at how well they take care of the sinners, she giggled silently. The crying man grabbed at the feet of the Naraka Navas in front of him, saying, Please, sir, I'm so thirsty. I've been thirsty for so long, I can't take it anymore. Smiling an ear-to-ear -ear grin, the Naraka Navas grabbed the man, pinning his arms behind his back while another blue-skinned bean came over with a black pot of boiling water. They forced the man's mouth open and poured the water down his throat, his skin being scalded off in papery layers by the intensity of the heat. As the door of the bus opened, dozens of blue-skinned men stormed it, dragging out each passenger one by one. The driver grinned, turning to look back at me, and I realized with horror that it was the same man that I had robbed in the alleyway. This is the last stop, friend. He set his piercing eyes, focusing so intently on me that I had to avert my gaze, and the blackness of his pupils seemed to expand and take over his entire eye. After all, didn't you come to me and ask for this? You demanded it by knife or by gun and you will get all of it you desire. Maybe even a little more in fact. He laughed sarcastically as the passenger screamed in panic before her. They were one by one dragged out of the door of the bus and thrown into the fires and streams of lava that cut past all around us. And then he pointed to the wall of the metal shelf nearest us, maybe a quarter mile away. I realized it had a door in it, one that stretched hundreds of feet in the air. 
From every 100,000 years, that door opens and those who are nearest can flee this place. He continued. And do you know where that door leads? It leads to a forest made of swords where their limbs are cut off. Their eyes are taken and their skin and muscle is sliced. And they are healed over and over and forced to run again. Their heads are taken off and their chests are opened. And they cry for it to end but it never comes. And that place too has a door. But the destination beyond each is just as foul and just as evil. So, it is for those with impurity in their hearts, those who hurt the innocent and harm the harmless. Their suffering is as incomprehensible as the universe itself, and as long as the last drop of evil karma is not exhausted, they will never die. As he spoke, the last passenger was dragged off, leaving just the driver, Zaneda and me in an otherwise totally empty bus. So, I'll ask you only once. Is this your stop or not? He said. Please, God, j just get me out of here, I said, starting to cry, despair taking over me. My withdrawals had disappeared under the terror and horror that I now felt. I had a mental vision of myself living here for millions or billions of years, having boiling water and molten lead poured down my throat, being thrown into streams of lava, but always healing, always returning, and always wishing for an end. I'll do anything, please, just to take me out of Naraka. Will you make good what you have done? Will you turn yourself in for the crimes that you've committed? He said, his smile disappearing, his face returning to its prior state. Yes, please, I don't want to end up like these people here, I cried. The driver turned away from me, starting the bus and driving forward on the road of bones. Soon we entered a black tunnel and the smell of smoke and burning flesh had started to pass away. As the bus exited the tunnel, I saw the incomprehensible relief of the pale blue sky of my world. We appeared to be in New York City, over a thousand miles away from where I had first started this morning. I saw Manhattan and its distinctive skyscrapers in the distance. The bus came to a stop in front of a bus depot. I turned to Zaneda who held out a black bowl made of some volcanic obsidian-like material. It was the same bowl that I had seen the Naraka Nava use when it poured boiling water into that poor man's mouth. This is for you, she said. A memory of your journey, perhaps. Take it with you and remember always. I smiled down at her. I will. I exited the bus and wrote this up on my way to the police station. I'm turning myself in for the robberies that I committed, among other major felonies. They will have to extradite me to the other state, but I'm going to tell them the truth and let whatever happens happen. Hopefully they have some leniency on me because of my addiction and my remorse, but I have no choice in the matter. Even life in prison would be far better than what I had already seen today. I'm going to send the bowl out to a scientific institute to be studied before I go into the police station now. If it is what I think it is, it may be made of a material never before seen on this planet, but one that only comes from Naraka. I hope I will never see that evil place again. The door is locked, and the gaps are plugged with towels, but I don't think that it'll make any difference. I can hear my neighbors driving by outside of the barricaded window, completely unaware of the horrors taking place inside this house. I guess I just want someone else to know the truth. It started as these things often do with something completely unexpected. An event that came screeching in out of the dark to smash the quiet life that I had built with my wife Alice and our son Jake. We had tried so hard to childproof our house. We had protected the power outlets, used baby gates, and stored dangerous chemicals far out of reach. I don't know where Jake had gotten a hold of that small glass bead. 
Maybe he even found it outside somewhere, in the street or at the playground. All I know is, at the moment that he swallowed it, that little ball of glass cut off his air supply completely. Alice and I tried desperately to remember the Heimlich maneuver and perform it on our squirming, crying, and purple-faced child. But we only made things worse. By the time the EMTs had arrived, Jake had stopped breathing. He lay in my wife's arms, limp and lifeless as a rag doll, drool dribbling out of his bluish lips. The looks on the paramedics' faces when they finally arrived told us everything that we needed to know. Despite their best recitation efforts, our son was gone. I still remember the way my wife's hot tears soaked through my shirt as we walked out to the ambulance with Jake. I wanted to hold his tiny hand until the last minute, until they loaded him into that sterile metal box and the doors had closed on him forever. But then suddenly, Jake grabbed my finger. His eyes snapped open and with a pop, the cat's eye bead popped right out of his mouth. The paramedics, they couldn't believe it. Resuscitation efforts had ended about eight minutes ago, and Jake had been legally dead for almost half an hour at that point. Lazarus Syndrome is what they called it. But I didn't care about names or diagnosis. I didn't care about testing and trials and clinical statistics. I was just happy to have my son back. Jake was quieter than I had remembered. Before, his big blue eyes had sparked like sunlight on the sea. Now, they seemed darker. Deeper, somehow, like I was looking into a still and bottomless pool. I found that I couldn't maintain eye contact with him for long. Maybe that was the first sign. Maybe that's when I should have acted. But it's too late for that now. Like most new parents, Alice and I had been terrified to leave Jake's side at the first. We kept his crib in our bedroom. But after his recovery, we found that we couldn't sleep with Jake nearby. He would just stand and stare at us all night, his hands grabbing the bars of his crib like a death row inmate in teddy bear pajamas. Although Alice and I never talked about it, we could both feel his gaze probing at the back of our skulls as though he were trying to drill them open and let something in. A few weeks later, we moved Jake's crib to my office. That's why we were so terrified to find him in bed with us at 3 a.m. the following night. He lay sucking his thumb with one hand, and the other on Alice's hip in a way that seemed strangely adult and possessive. Worse still, when I lifted that hand out of the corner of my eye, it didn't seem like a toddler's arm at all. It looked stretched, hairy, and horrible. While I carried my sleeping son back to his crib, I wondered if I was having some kind of psychological reaction to the trauma of what had happened to Jake and his unexpected resuscitation. That could be the only explanation for the things that I was seeing and feeling, right? As I put Jake back in his crib, I noticed something red on his lip. With awful adult intelligence, he quickly tried to hide it away from me, but I spun him back around. Jake opened his mouth wide. A waterfall of red poured out. I had never seen so much of it in my life. I screamed for Alice and looked around for something, anything to stop the bleeding. 
and behind me I could hear the stream splattering on the floor. And that wasn't all. When I turned again, hundreds of round cat's eye beads were dribbling from my son's mouth. What? Alice burst into the room with a shout. I pointed to Jake. But he was fine. Our son sat sleepily in his crib with a puzzled expression on his face, as though he was concerned about my weird behavior. I tried to stammer an explanation to Alice on our walk back to bed, but I couldn't shake the feeling that my son was laughing silently at me behind my back. From there, things only got worse. The next night, I woke from a revolting dream in which a giant leech was writhing around inside of my bedsheets. It was sucking me dry. And just like in the dream, there was a weight in my chest when I awoke. It was Jake, giggling as he crawled around our bed. It was all that I could do to keep myself from shoving him off of me. This is your son, I told myself. You love him. And it was all true. But more and more, I was starting to wonder whether the thing inside that crib was really Jake at all. I installed a bolt on Jake's bedroom door. Surely that would stop his late night wanderings. But the next night, my son was back in bed with us again. I placed a motion activated camera on the hallway, hoping to figure out how on earth Jake had opened the bolt. And what I saw on that eerie night vision footage, well, it'll haunt me for the rest of my life. Something slid beneath my son's door. A hand. At first, it looked just like Jake's hand. But as the arm stretched upwards towards the lock, and the fingers extended, its appearance changed into something monstrous. My son's arm had somehow passed beneath the door, reached all the way up its length, and unbolted its lock with clawed and hairy fingers. The hideous arm retracted, the door creaked open, and Jake crawled along the ceiling toward our bedroom. The last still image the camera captured was Jake's freakishly extended foot and snarling face as he kicked it away. I watched the clip again and again, unable to reconcile what I had seen with the toddler dozing peacefully just a few feet away. During the daytime, Jake seemed completely normal. He threw tantrums, colored and played with his toys, asked a question every five seconds, and fell asleep eating his Cheerios. Maybe it was just at night when he... A sudden thump jolted me out of my reverie. Jake was awake. In fact, he was standing right next to me, a lifeless expression on his face. He had just slammed his little fist into my computer, right above the port where I had inserted the camera's SD card. Was he trying to destroy the video? Thump. Thump. Jake brought his fist down two more times with impossible strength, shattering my laptop's fragile plastic covering and the SD card inside of it. And that wasn't all. My mind didn't want to process it, it couldn't process it. But Jake had grown taller than me. I looked down in horror at the extra 40 inches of deformed flesh that started at my son's pajama bottoms and ended in the clawed feet on the floor. I shut my eyes and clamped down a scream. When I opened them again, Jake was crawling on the rug, completely fixated on the toy truck in front of him. His face and body were completely normal, but my laptop was a broken mess. Jake or whatever was inside of him, it was getting more powerful. 
Alice and I felt hunted inside of our own home. Whenever we tried to discuss what was happening to Jake, we would hear his tiny feet scurrying impossibly fast and suddenly, he would be standing right beside us, listening, watching with those dark, blue, endlessly deep eyes. After what happened last night, I suppose I can't blame Alice for leaving. I would spend the day installing a key-operated lock on Jake's bedroom door. I set up a baby camera in the room that streamed live to Alice and I, in case that he needed us, I would tell myself. But the truth was is that I had set it up for our own protection. If Jake started to change, we would know about it. The new setup was supposed to help us get some sleep, but in the end, Alice and I just lay awake watching what was happening on the other side of that baby camera. We stared at our perfectly ordinary snoozing, thumb-sucking toddler as though we were watching a tense scene in a horror movie, the kind so terrifying that it's impossible to look away. We had gone without sleep for so long. I suppose it was just a matter of time. I couldn't blame Alice when she dozed off on my shoulder. I kept nodding off as well. I tried to tell myself that one of us needed to keep watch. But every time I looked up, the scene on the screen was unchanged. The small cute shape of Jake in his onesie pajamas, one arm around his teddy bear. Hey, maybe things are fine now. The treacherous, exhausted part of my brain would whisper, maybe the danger or whatever it was has passed. My chin hit my chest and my eyes popped open with a start. A dark shape, probably Jake's teddy bear, lay in front of the camera blocking it. And where was our son? At first, I didn't notice the sounds coming from beside me. I turned slowly, almost not wanting to see, and I saw Jake's monstrous fingers toying with my wife's hair. His open mouth was pressed against hers, and something bulky and hideous was sliding down her throat. Although whether Jake was draining something out of Alice or infesting her with something of his own, I couldn't tell. My whole world became this horrible strangled sound those two entangled figures, lit only by the eerie green glow of the screen, and my own paralyzing fear. Alice's hand struggled feebly, trying to pry Jake off of her, but it was only then that I found the strength to act. I grabbed Jake from behind and pulled. It took both of our combined strength to pry him, screeching and flailing off of Alice's face. Both of their mouths were covered with a lipstick smear coating a bright red. Alice coughed and spit something up, a tiger's eyeglass bead. She stared at it for a long second and then grabbed her purse and walked out of the door. I could hear Jake giggling beside me as Alice started her car in the misty 4am darkness. Even then, I knew in my heart that I would never see her again. I've been home alone with Jake since then. He's been testing the boundaries, changing more often and more obviously. I think he knows that no help is coming for me. I can hear him running through the house, laughing, smashing things for fun. It's only a matter of time now. I'm not afraid of death. The moment that Alice left, I had accepted my fate. No. What I'm afraid of is, what if death is not the end? What if, after whatever Jake does to me, I wake up again and spit a tiger's eyeball of glass out onto the floor? What if I wake up as something else? I've told you... I'm very happy being single and, no, I don't need any more books on how to pick up girls. I shot a glare at the book that spontaneously flipped itself open on my desk. 
I know you mean well, Otis, but really, I'm fine. The book closed its cover by itself, as if sadly set down by an invisible hand. All I want is to be done with this graveyard shift so that I can go home and sleep, but I'll welcome your book recommendations for succulent gardening. I've been into that lately. I offered, trying to sound friendlier so that Otis wasn't so put down. Otis has been a part of this library as long as I can remember. Not all ghosts are bad ghosts. Otis has saved my life more times than I can count, and I own one or a hundred. You see, the problem is, is that this library is trying to kill me. Well, not me specifically. It's tried to do that to every one of the people who have worked the graveyard shift at this library, as far as they can remember. Why not just open the library during the daytime only, you say? Well, that would be a grand old idea. Except it's a cursed library that requires being open all day and all night. Lest a terrible curse befall this small town out in the middle of nowhere. In other words, this library being active is like a prison lock on demons that would really love to no longer be kept under guard of a glorified prison warden, me, so that they can possess and curse this entire little town. Someone has to make sure the occult books don't spontaneously go missing or go start casting spells by themselves. And yes, we tried to burn them and run them through the paper shredders. All that got shredded was the paper shredder itself. Well, it's almost 1am. I sat to the empty air, just as several alarms at my desk had started to ring, signaling that it was 5 minutes until 1 o'clock in the morning. I turned off the multiple alarms and set them again for tomorrow night. Never could be too careful. Okay, Otis, I'm going to start the routine. I said as I took a blindfold out of a drawer and put it on myself. While my hand blindly reached for the dust cloth and a bottle of surface cleaner that I always used. The routine was really a list of rules that were to be followed every night. I had survived this long at this job because I was particularly uncreative and just very good at following the rules. A teacher's pet type of person, if you will. By now, I had had these memorized by heart. But to sum them up, there are a few rules that are active the whole night, and some rules that are only active at certain times. Rule number one. The light above the librarian receptionist desk should never be turned off. Please change the light bulb every three months, the sooner if you wish to be more careful. Rule number two. If you feel a heavy sense of dread and a hand upon your shoulder, drinking water or another beverage should help. Rule number three. Books will sometimes fall off the shelves and open themselves to pages of the occult. Leaving them for too long will allow the demons to copy and draw demonic circles and other spell work into the ground. Please replace them on the shelf as soon as possible. Rule number four. Make sure all doors to the outside of the library are locked and deadbolted. Rule number five. At 1 a.m. to 2 a.m. you may see dark figures looking through the windows and glass panels at you. Though the figures are black, their eyes are wide-eyed and bloodshot. Avoid looking into the eyes by any means possible. Failure to do so will result in the figures being able to break through the glass. Rule number six. At 1 a.m., the figures will be watching to see if you are working. Please either mop or wipe surfaces down to keep up an appearance of working. Failure to do so will agitate the figures, 
possibly allowing them to break through the glass. Rule number seven. At 2 a.m. you may stop cleaning. The figures should be gone from the windows. By now, a new figure should have appeared in the library, in a chair in section B. You are to pull up a chair and stay in the lobby for the next hour. If at any point the figure gets up or looks at you, you are to avoid speaking a single word to the figure until 3 a.m., at which the figure should disappear. Do not answer any of the figure's questions or comments. Do not talk to yourself and do not talk to anyone. You cannot wear a blindfold during this time in case the figure tries to steal the occult books. Rule number eight. 3 a.m. is the most challenging part of the night. Illusions and hallucinations may begin to befall you during the witching hour. It is imperative that you show no signs of fear and an uplifted mood if at all possible. Every reaction of shock, a facial expression of fear, or dread will allow the apparitions to gradually possess you. Every mistake will make it easier for the next mistake to happen. Failure to endure until 5 a.m. will result in an irreversible loss of your soul. It was almost time that the figures started to appear in the windows. I found that the best way to not look into their eyes was to not look at all. I double blindfolded myself too, one with a velcro strap and then I layered one of those nighttime sleeping masks on top. One time I tripped and the blindfold had ripped off my head end. Well, let's just say that I'll never make that mistake again. The nice thing about the make sure you appear working by cleaning is that you don't actually need to clean well so long as you look busy and you're ignoring the creepy figures in the windows. I randomly felt for a bookshelf and then sprayed it and began wiping it down, trying to feel where the moisture was. After a few minutes of cleaning, I would feel a hand on my shoulder pushing me, but I could never tell if it was the malicious hand on your shoulder or if it was just Otis helpfully pushing me along so that I didn't stay too long in one spot. I heard some tapping on the glass. Ignoring it, I sprayed down a counter and haphazardly wiped it down the best that I could. Tap, tap, tap. It was getting louder. Finally, it sounded like something was pounding a fist on the glass and it sounded like the glass was going to give way and shatter. However, I just ignored it. Though my natural instinct made me want to take off my blindfold and check that they weren't breaking through the glass, I was a good boy following the rules. I could barely hear it, but these soft whispers of some syllables began drifting from the doors. Just like the tapping, the whispers became louder, demanding to be let in until they became frightfully loud and human-like yells that pierced the dead quiet of the library. Let me in, please. Please, let me in. Let me in, let me in, let me in. There was a time that a foolish, younger version of myself used to taunt the voices back. But I stopped doing that once a chair was thrown at me. Again, I couldn't tell if that was Otis stopping me from doing something stupid. Or perhaps my taunts were giving the spirits power to affect the material world. A symphony of alarms rang from the receptionist desk to tell me that it was now 2am. This challenge was a little harder because... Having to take off your blindfold and directly watch a scary shadowy figure that could get up and talk to you, it was very hard to stay calm with, let alone prevent yourself from talking or making a sound with your mouth. Running back to the receptionist desk, 
I pulled out a grey roll of duct tape from the many that I kept in the drawer, and I ripped off a large piece, and I securely put it over my mouth. The best way not to talk is to be unable to talk, right? With this, I just needed to make sure that I didn't make any guttural sounds. Behind me, I heard some pages flip and a thud of books. Otis was reading, presumably now that I couldn't talk to it. Over time, I came to appreciate the gentle sounds of pages flipping, as it felt like a safe and calming ASMR. Looking ahead as if right on cue, a shadowy figure sat in a chair at section B. How do you do? It called from afar. I ignored it. I pulled out a book series that I had been reading, trying to give myself something else to focus on, and I put on a pair of noise-canceling headphones. I said, how do you do? Silence. I flipped to where my bookmark dutifully sat to remind me of where I was in the story. You're being extremely rude. All you have to do is say a simple, hello. The figure's voice was becoming more aggressive in tone, and I was starting to be able to hear him through my headphones. It was going to be a long hour. Look up. Look at me, you idiot. Look up. By now I realized that I had been rereading the same sentence over and over. I tried so hard to concentrate on the next sentence, and I stared at the words, drinking everything in. If this went as normally as the other nights, the figure would yell and scream and beg until it got bored. A shadowy face with bright white, bloodshot eyes suddenly appeared between my face and the bug. Their impossibly widened eyes and dilated pupils, staring straight back into my eyes. It took everything in me to refrain from making a throat sound in alarm. But my chair fell over backward with a heavy thud and I involuntarily grunted with the painful impact. Immediately, dread washed over me as soon as I realized what I had done. And then something new happened. The figure suddenly grew a mouth, with a disturbingly long length that went ear to ear and smiled with such intensity that it struck fear into my heart. I froze like a deer in headlights. Seeing my shocked expression, the figure grew in power, and it ripped my headphones right off my head. Next, it tried to take off the duct tape as well, but its grip was not yet corporeal enough to pull off duct tape so I slapped my hand over my mouth just in time and I ran away and sprinted for the receptionist desk. Ignoring the figure, I tore off more duct tape to create a huge X on my face, and it couldn't be ripped off so easily. And during this, the figure tried to push me to prevent me from protecting myself and to shake me up even further. Suddenly, out of nowhere, a unicorn book nailed me directly in the back, and I nearly made a coughing noise from it. Looking down, I saw the cover that had ridiculously pink unicorns and unnecessary sparkles running all over the cover. Another book headed my way and launched at me, this time a Captain Underpants book. And then it was a book of puns and corny jokes and then a book about dog poo. I realized that that was Otis, trying to distract me from my fear by throwing books with funny or ridiculous covers. Thank God for Otis. It was working too. I eventually began to smile with my eyes at the ridiculousness 
of the various books that it was chucking at me. Otis, likely being a poltergeist, was incapable of throwing things gently. Soon, 2 a.m. was over and gave way to its superior, 3 a.m. But that's when the real problem started. Hallucinations and delusions are no problem when they can't touch or hurt you. But having broken rule number seven of not making any verbal sounds during the 2 a.m. slot, I was about to learn what happens when a nightmare can hurt you. I was around 8 years old when I realized, as did my family, that I had a unique memory. Photographic, they called it. It's nothing like a photograph. I always assumed everybody could recall their first day of preschool, or the names of kids they met only once at the arcade. But at 11 years old, my sister Cammie was chosen for a game show on the radio. Without hesitation, she chose me as her teammate to bring with her. She could have chosen either of her parents or even her older brother, Charlie, who was in college at the time. She could have picked one of her friends, eighth graders like herself, but she chose me. I remember sitting around the kitchen table eating dinner. The pitch black Midwest winter night just outside the giant kitchen window behind my dad. He and my mom were totally supportive of the idea. He had offered even to drive us to the radio station. I would have chosen you too, Bobby. My mom had said laughing. You remember every weird fact ever. It was true. I could close my eyes and see every house my parents had ever brought us into. I could draw the floor plans if I had wanted to. My siblings would ask me to retell stories or movie plots on long car rides. But it wasn't until the radio show and my sister choosing me as her person that I knew that I had something special. I can still remember going to bed that night after dinner feeling excited. I finally fell asleep in my bed, pressed up against the wall that divided my room from my sister's. Her voice through the vent above at my bed saying goodnight like she did every night. The smell of dust on the furnace. The sound of old, creaking boards directly above me in the cold attic. That was the last night I was happy to have an amazing memory. To this day, I wish I could forget what happened next. I wish I could tell you that we had won the game show. I wish I could tell you with incredible detail what it was like at the studio. Maybe then, when I closed my eyes, I would see all of that. And not the black, whipping night blurring past me as I ran. I would feel the rush of anticipation in my sister's hand squeezing mine. Instead of cold, wet gravel scraping my cheek and palms from when I tried to crawl away on two sprained ankles. I would hear the producers cue in the canned audience applause, not the frantic, desperate flapping of leathery wings as they neared. Maybe I would have won a t-shirt that still sits in my dresser. Maybe my sister would have won the thousand other prize. Maybe I would sleep with my door unlocked. I'll never know. What I do know without any shadow of a doubt is that I would not have survived any of it if my family hadn't believed me. To this day, it's the thing that I'm most grateful for in the entire world. It was the day after that dinner, a Tuesday, February 17th. The school had been agonizingly slow as I knew it would be all week waiting for Friday. It was all that we could talk about on the way home. For years, I had walked to school with Yuki and my best friend, Dominic, who lived in the street perpendicular to mine. The creek crossed under Cistrine Drive and wound its way along Dominic's backyard. There are hundreds of childhood memories in my head, of he and I and our siblings jumping over the creek, 
building bridges from his yard over the creek to the field behind the rec center. Sliding on the ice in the winter, or attempting to fish and turtle catch in the summer. I always had envied my friends who could walk right from their back door to our little winding creek. It was cold, but it hadn't snowed for a few weeks. There were still some small patches of ice on the sidewalk, but most of it had melted, along with these slurry gray mounds of a stale snow along the curbs, and in small, scattered patches on the grass. I had balked at my mother's suggestion to wear a skirt and heels to the radio show. There was massive construction happening on the other side of the creek. They were building a stupid business center on the field that we used to play kickball on. The crane was visible between two houses behind us. The snow was due that weekend and everything would be coated and beautiful once again. The downside of a blanket of snow was the eerie quiet that it caused and how hard it was to sleep at night when the moonlight and the snow were so bright, even with my eyes closed. It was nearing 6 p.m. and the mid-February sky was already darkening. We had stopped under the flickering gold streetlight at the corner of Citrine and Amethyst, my street. I remember huddling close in a group and talking. I remember the wind picking up in the edges of the sky glowing purple behind the houses along Citrine. This was when my oldest brother on a break for one or more week drove up to the corner in our mom's sedan. Hey Bobby, he had called, giving my friends a little wave and they all returned. He was returning some jeans to the mall and wanted me to come with him. It was rare that Charlie asked me to do anything. I think about that a lot. Had he paid more attention to me before that night, would I have gotten in the car? Would things have been different? I think about all the choices I made that led up to what happened, but not as much as the decision to get into the car with my brother instead of walking home that evening. Maybe I wouldn't sleep in the closet. Maybe I would have a family of my own. I'll never know. Then again, maybe we would have never seen Charlie again. If you asked, I could tell you every moment of that trip to the mall. The conversation that we had. Mainly Charlie and asking if things fit him or were flattering. And Charlie had come out to our parents a few months before that night. And they were not surprised or phased. He had told me that night that he had gone to a new bar and felt undressed and how he felt pressured to be fashionable. The last thing that Charlie said to me before we got in that car was, It's funny, even if you're different, there's still pressure to be the same. At 8.53pm on Tuesday, February 17th of 1998, Charlie and I were in the front seat of our mother's 1995 maroon Lumina. We were at the final stop sign on the ride home. It was 38 degrees outside and Pearl Jam's 10 was in the CD player. We were at the corner of Pondside and Citrine, about to turn left into our neighborhood and home to our family. Our mother had lasagna waiting for us. We were third in line at the three-way stop. On Charlie's side of the street was a Yuki's house with pretty lanterns lining the paved path to the courtyard of their U Ranch home. On my side, past my window, was the pond. The path that led around the pond and up the hill was bright at the edges from the streetlight, but quickly faded to black, with only the occasional twinkle of a back porch light in the distance. The remains of the moon tower built in the 70s were barely discernible against the sky. Only via the absence of stars and the shape of the structure, it was only recognizable to those of us who grew up there. It was a scene that had made me feel small and afraid countless times. The cold radiating from the window made me feel even more anxious, though now I realized that was adrenaline, an ancient alarm system going off in my bloodstream. Survival mode manifesting in goosebumps and what I mistook for the heebie-jeebies. The black, black of the moon tower against the blue black of the sky shifted as my eyes stared and adjusted. 
I thought about a sleepover game Dominic and I had played when we were in third grade. Staring at each other's faces in the dark until they morphed and changed and threw us into giggle fits. It wasn't until the bottom left star of the hill had disappeared that I realized it wasn't my eyes playing tricks on me. It wasn't until the pitch grew larger that I opened my mouth to say something. Charlie was deep in the chorus of even flow and never heard it coming. It was a low whistle, like an old man out for a walk. Two notes, one high and one lower. It repeated again louder and I had turned to tell Charlie when I saw the red light of the brake lights of the car in front of us fade from his face as he finally saw what was coming. Only it hadn't come from the pitch black over the pond. It came from the other side, slamming into the driver's side of the car in front of us, shattering the glass into a hailstorm crashing onto our windshield. The impact was so intense that both left wheels had lifted off the ground. Charlie initially cursed loudly and went to open his door to help. I had screamed at him not to, but I barely got a word out before. A penetrating silent vacuum filled the air around me, sucking the air from my lungs. Seconds later, my window was shattering over me. Glass stinging my cheek and the wind whipping my blood across my face into my mouth as I screamed. I knew before I opened my eyes that it wasn't just an accident. There was no car or bike or even human assailant. I knew before I pried my eyes open that everything I had feared as a child, that all the myths and legends and ghost stories were real. I knew it wasn't bats or birds. I knew as I felt frantic clawing at the nylon remains of my seatbelt that it was a monster. Not a cute storybook monster, but an ancient, angry, and bitter creature. One that had been there long before I had, or the town had, or even people had. The last thing I saw before I felt hooks sink into my shoulders and was lifted into the black, swirling cold was Charlie slumped over the steering column. Eddie Vedder's voice still calling out to me until I couldn't hear him anymore. Not for one second did I think it was a dream. The cold made sure of that. My legs heavily dragging across the broken glass of the car window, ripping my jeans and slamming my legs into the frame. I knew that it was real. The biting night sky whipping around as I violently sank a few feet as the hooks in my shoulder began to slip. I experienced a new level of pain as I felt jagged talons pierce my side and I folded forward as I yanked backwards into the pitch. I felt another agonizing piercing on the other side of my torso before being yanked up away from the earth and everything that I had ever known. I was pulled into the pitch past the streetlights, but whatever had me it was struggling. I fell twenty feet into the ice, hard gravel path, but wasn't freed. Violent metallic screams flooded my ears and bones as my forehead and chin were scraped along the gravel path. I desperately clawed at the earth, trying to find anything to grip but only found fistfuls of gravel and goose poop. The talons in my side ripped out suddenly and I felt a sickening oozing coming from my sides. I had tried to roll over to my knees but the pain on each side was so horrible that I felt bile swelling in my throat. A patch of dirty snow was inches away and I tried to crawl towards it to try to ice my bleeding injuries. And that was when I felt leathery whips of my face and violent snacks in my hair pulling and snapping. My stomach lurched as again. I was yanked up into the night, higher into my own icy black death. I tried desperately to grasp onto whatever had me, terrified to fall as we climbed higher. The cold stung my raw shoulders and hips and I felt the blood freezing. The deep scrapes on my knees and face burned with the wind, feeling like icy razors scraping my cheekbones. My numb fingers found a thick, velvety limb, coarse hair bristling and slipping under my blood. Six daggers dug into my skull and neck, 
Even over the roar of the wind and the pounding of wings, I could hear a horrible scraping and squeaking of claws on my skull from the inside. I struggled to breathe. Fluid, it filled my mouth and tears threatened to suffocate me. Suddenly, the little air that I had in my lungs was forced out violently as my midsection was slammed into the highest beam on the moon tower. The crunching of my ribs was unmistakable. My vision and even my own thoughts darkened with what I can only describe as wetness. Later, I would be told that my ribs were so violently broken that they had pierced my lung. For a moment, the moon illuminated the nightmare. I was nauseatingly high up. One eye was swollen shut, but I could see the frozen pond dull and distant. Closer, I could see a row of houses, their windows glowing but cruelly out of reach. One house still had Christmas lights up, complete with a giant, light-up plastic mold Santa Claus tied to their chimney. It felt wrong and cruel, a warm and happy impossibility. I looked down to see a stream of my blood pouring from my body in a steady flow, then broken by an aggressive gust of icy cold wind. I choked on a scream as I was grabbed again, talons stretching out the existing wounds on my shoulders and birthing brand new ones on my lower back. I couldn't hear my own screams over the wind and the angry metallic shrieks like barbed wire on a rusted trampoline. I remember at this point that I could see the pond shrinking south of me as once again my host had struggled with its prey. Suddenly, we dropped right above the creek. My legs slammed into the fence surrounding the construction site, the crane looming over us, the two security floodlights at its base finally providing light. The construction site was deep in the ground, a parking garage with a basement level built to be tornado proof. I've heard countless times from other people with violent experiences that they forgot chunks of their trauma or that they had blacked out. I try not to seethe with jealousy. If I could forget any of it, I would want to forget what I saw under those garish white construction lights. I can remember every tiny ice cold pebble digging into my skin, the shimmering light on my tear soaked lashes the gritty, jagged pain of my pulverized ribs. I remember the smell, a mix of a cold sweat, like when our dad would come home after his jogs, diesel and blood. There was another smell coming from the base of the crane, sickly sweet like almond extract gone bad. Behind the crane was a trailer, the paneling was beige and a huge green tin sign it read, Argon Construction. I thought for a moment that a phone might be inside. I pulled myself up onto my knees and looked around. It was difficult since my left eye was useless and my right one was full of tears and blood. My assailant was nowhere in sight. I thought maybe that it had gotten injured or caught on the fence. Stupid. I know now that it simply was rousing its companion because it was dinner time and I was an offering. Like when my cat Nala would bring me a dead robin. Here I was with my wings ripped off. I was halfway to the trailer, limping as fast as I could. Every step was excruciating. Breathing was like pins and needles. Even with my sobbing hyperventilating, I had heard it. I hear it now, and I can always hear it. The two-toned whistle. Haunting and dreadful. Like even if I hadn't been at death's door, that tone would still have shaken me. It was like a doomsday alarm, like useless sirens wailing as meteors crashed into the boiling sea. Under the whistle a thick, wet breath, echoing from beneath the base of the crane, a dark recess in the cold and wet ground with darkness somehow leaking from it. Darkness so black that only a staccatoed steam was visible. Something was breathing. I wish I could tell you that the construction on Earth is something ethereal, a beautiful sleeping giant and angel a groundbreaking discovery. But I don't even think it was the construction. I just think that she's always been here. 
Maybe for years she had survived on squirrels or deer. Maybe she thawed during a warm winter. Maybe she was left behind. The first thing I saw was the tattered, jagged tips of wings, bat-like and narrow, dark-veined like bruised plum skin. Her pulse visibly pumping through veins that raised and ripped through her paper-thin skin, stretching over her wings so tightly it seemed painful just to exist. Like she wasn't finished yet, like she had been birthed from the earth prematurely and she was angry. Her hair was matted in clumps, but where it was free, it was long enough to drag along the ground, slimy and cold and full of dirt, leaves, and dirty snow. Her scalp was suffering. I could see every follicle piercing her scalp, like diseased plant roots, bulbous and swollen. Open sores at her hairline showed what I can only stomach to explain as insect activity. Layers of sick, sheer skin being actively eaten away. Forehead wrinkles deep and scarred into place. She had no eyebrows or lashes that I could see from my crouched hiding position. Her nose was just a cavity, like a Halloween skull also swarming with parasites. When she breathed in, a flapping rippled down her face and wetness dripped over her mouth her mouth. Years later, an art teacher had told me that while he enjoyed my monstrous horror drawings, that even special effects departments had boundaries and I would be unlikely to get hired if I didn't tone it down or attempt to make them more realistic. If only he had known that I was following his rule. Draw what you know. She had the familiar sagging of a toothless old woman with flat, cracked lips. But then she parted them. The rot was dizzying. Her gums had been clawed away, scabs and scars and thick bands of roped, grayish maw flesh. Her top and bottom jaw bones were not simply bared. They were jagged, layered razors. Filed. But not with anything modern or sharp or clean. Time madness and desperation had filed and shaped that nightmare maw. Makeshift teeth of rocks had been maniacally shoved under the skin, adhered with infection and growth. The entire left side of her face was worn through layer by layer, her tongue slipping in and out of what should have been her throat. Sharp, gaunt collarbones literally piercing through that tissue-like skin. Dark, rancid, pooling in the deep recesses of her collar. The left side of her chest was deeply scarred and textured, as though it had been burned. Her fingers were bones with jagged talons blackened at the tips. Thick scar tissue marred her shoulders where her wings took her from somewhat humanoid to monstrous. Scars everywhere. Rotting wound dripped larva and red onto the frozen ground. I wish I could forget the momentary warmth I felt as something poured down my legs, immediately freezing and burning, sticking my jeans to the raised shins. I tore myself away from staring at her to look for an escape. She had chosen her feeding place well. The deep recess of the site was the length of a football field, since that's what the field had once been. High walls of frozen earth surrounded us on three sides. Climbing up in my condition would have been impossible. There is a ramp at the far entrance, but I wouldn't have made it past her. Only behind me was the fence that I had slammed into on the way in, the creek only a few yards away from that, and then a row of backyards of houses that included Dominic's. I had cried then. I cried that thinking only a few minutes away, my best friend was probably getting ready for bed that he would always remember the night before he woke up to find his best friend was dead. He had no idea that my red was spilling all over the places that we had run and played. He was warm and with his own mom just a feet away. I sobbed then, thinking of my own mother. It wasn't the idea of her finding out too or knowing that I would never see her again. It was a guttural, instinctual, painful need for her. It was like being too far underwater and being out of breath. 
kicking as fast as I can but knowing that I wouldn't make it. I needed her but wouldn't make it to the surface, to her. My sobbing had given me away. That horrible metallic sound reverberated around me and I remembered. I was being fed and she was feeding me to something. I had taken a deep breath, bracing myself for the pain and I made for the fence. Before my feet even hit the ground, her claws were in my neck. She flung me further from the trailer and onto the cement that had been poured a few warmer months ago. I gave up. I'll be honest. I accepted that I was going to die. And then I had heard something unexpected and sickening. Small, furtive movements. Unmistakable vocalizations. Even just from primal grunting and what groans I knew. I knew that it was young and I knew that it was human. I felt her toxic breath on me before I realized that she had moved. She paused for a second, mapping the wounds that she had inflicted, so that she could use them again as grips. That was when she dug in so tight into the openings on my shoulders that I could feel her nails were deep inside my muscles and even the tips of her actual fingers were deep inside the wounds. She flung me further across the cement, closer to the sickening furtive movement. I squeezed my eyes shut. I smelled rancid, organic decay. I felt small, fluttering fingers on my neck. Small, little, childlike. I made the inevitable mistake of opening my eyes. I saw dirty blonde hair tinged with green draped across tiny feet. Human feet. Baby feet. He was maybe three, dirty and small. His fingernails were long and sharpened to a point. He smiled and thick mucus stretched across several black and sharp teeth. He was missing some, but what remained were crooked, stained and diseased, stuck in purple, rotten gums. Instead of chubby, rosy cheeks, he had hollow, sunken gray skin. The bags under his eyes were purple and veined. Instead of bright and youthful eyes, there were haunted orbs, devoid of color. Fady milky irises deformed around dark soulless pupils. He wore what at one time had been pajamas, under layers of dirt and grime. Little trains chugged across his small body in a pattern. The sobs had returned from their hiding place in my chest. I had felt the need to comfort the small broken doll of a child. And that's when he lunged. His broken glass mouth sinking deep into my forearm. The pain was unbelievable. Bright and loud like the headlights of a truck barreling down on you. I pulled away and heard a horrifying squelching sound as my forearm flesh ripped and hung from his tiny plump lips. I gagged as he hungrily shoved my skin into his mouth. He ran to the monster, clinging to her body, his stubby hands sinking into her rotting fruit skin. I held my hand tightly against my forearm, watching the liquid spill in tributaries between my fingers and joining a river down my arm, dripping down to the ground. It began to snow. Tiny delicate laceworks fell into and melted into these steaming pools of blood at my feet. A disgusting gurgling sound brought me back, and I watched in horror as the little boy nursed from the creature. Thick blood spilled from the sides of his mouth as she gently swept the hair from his face. Years later, I would look up the missing children's database online. I would narrow my search to my state, select the birth year, clumsily guess at the date missing. It would take me six days and two breakdowns, but I would find them, along with an inaccurate age progression picture. His parents had named him Mason, and he was a twin. He had a baby sister and a dog. He went missing from a family camping trip when he and his brother were one, but I didn't know any of that when I watched him wash down my flesh with milk from a demon that I hadn't even known existed a few hours earlier. Hours earlier, I had been at a mall for Christ's sake. The mall with Charlie. I guess remembering my brother's body hanging limply across the steering column had jarred me into action. 
Knowing that he wasn't even a football field away from me got me moving. If I could just get over the fence, I could make a beeline for Dominic's backyard. I would just have to jump over the mostly frozen creek to get there. And then I could run to his parents' window and have them call the police. I could see the yellow square in the dark that was the sliding glass door to their kitchen from where I was. If I ran through their house as a shortcut, I could run down their driveway and straight down my street to my house. My heart broke a little as I thought of my parents and my sister, beginning to worry about us as we were only a block away fighting for our lives. But if I got to the far end of the fence before the incline up, I could get to Charlie and keep him safe, keep him warm and talking until the ambulance had arrived. Surely somebody had called. The impact on the cars was so loud. The other driver surely had a car phone or maybe a cell phone. Maybe even Yuka's puppy, Mochi, had heard and was barking up a storm. Maybe the police were already there. For a moment, I thought of grabbing the boy even if he bit me. I would carry him on my back and get him away from her, get him back home to his family. But even as I stood there, I could barely hold myself up. The world had started to spin around me, red, thickly but steadily pulling in my shoes and at the top of my jeans. A few feet from my right lay a rubble pile, not large but mainly chunks of rebar and concrete. I had barely made it a few inches of progress towards it when her metallic screeching again attacked my senses, my hands covering my ears. I shuffled towards the pile and grabbed a chunk of the rubble a crude misshape and an awkward hammer to wield against an impossible enemy. A rusted, a twisted metal handle with a heavy and uneven weight of concrete, hard to hold and even harder to swing. But it was all that I had, and I knew that it only had to get to the weakest part of her. I only had to incapacitate her long enough to get within earshot of Dominic's house. It couldn't be much later than 10 p.m. Somebody would have to hear me. I gripped my shoddy weapon tightly at my chest with both hands and felt her swoop down violently as I dove for a cement tunnel, her empty-handed dive throwing her off balance. I scrambled awkwardly towards the far end of the tunnel as I heard her raspy wings pulling her upwards before her second strike. Instead of waiting for her to cut me off of the tunnel, I ran as fast as I could, darting from the opening in towards the sickly sweet smelling of her nest. The only thing between the fence and me was a blonde baby boy. Blood swirled in my mouth and a gritty sharp feeling forced me to spit. I don't know why the image of my tooth in my hand covered in blood had triggered a response in me then, but it did. I knew that I was dying. Not just that I was going to die, that this monster my parents had never imagined in their worst nightmares would take their daughter away forever, and they would never even have her body to bury but that I currently and actively was dying. The damage to my ribs, lungs, spleen, and arm would kill me if the blood loss or hypothermia didn't do it first. I knew that I was dying and it turned me into a monster too. I ran, not straight for the fence, but for her nest, and I could hear her above me barreling down. I ran right toward that little boy and swung a 20-pound chunk of concrete down in his tiny hand, smashing it into the ground. The sound that he made wakes me up at night to this day. His screams were animal-like and I dropped my weapon to cover my ears. The rusted metal screaming from the sky crashed down like a bomb and I ran. I didn't look back. I ran to the fence and with all the strength that I had left, I pulled myself up, shoving my foot into a diamond-shaped hole made by the chain link. I had hopped a thousand fences this way in my life and to this day, I am grateful that I had this experience. My bleeding hands that found the freezing horizontal pipe of the top of the fence and groaned in pain as I hefted myself over. All the fence hopping experience in the world wouldn't have made climbing with shattered ribs and bleeding flanks any less impossible, and I could only crash to the ground. Both ankles jarred into the frozen ground and my scream stuck in my throat, caught on red and bile escaping only as a choking sob. 
Her violent, crazed screams were still on the ground as she tended to her baby. But I didn't let guilt slow me down. I ran as fast as I could for maybe six feet before my ankles gave out. Dominic's house was all that I could see. A tunnel of black closing in on my vision. I never looked back. I gripped my fingers into the frosty ground pulling myself up. I hobbled, sprinting across the dark field. The night sky above me swirling with snow flurries. My busted fingers fumbling at my jacket zipper. I could see the flickering blue glow of late night TV coming from Mr. and Mrs. Rosa's bedroom. The tunnel grew smaller and I could see less and less. Bawling, I forced my arms out of my jacket as I reached the bank of the creek. Dominic and I had spent our summers of our childhood testing the width of the creek along its entirety, and I knew that the bend behind his house was not jumpable. My toes slipped over the crest of land and razor-sharp talons slashed in my hands. I screamed and screamed and swung my jacket into the writhing storm of limbs and wings above me, feeling solid impact on one of the swings. I let go of my jacket and flung myself across the frozen creek, landing with a foot left, my feet crushing through the glass-thin ice and my ankles crumpling beneath me. I could only see a pinhole in front of me, a flickering blue of TV light. I could hear her above me, driving down finally for the kill. Her metallic screams and the deafening boom of Mr. Rosa's handgun, the one I had never even knew he had. He was standing on the back porch, one hand over his head, gun pointed to the sky. Mrs. Rosa stood next to him, Dominic's baseball bat in her hands. The last thing that I saw was the golden warm glow of the Rosa's kitchen, and the pinhole closing as the world darkened around me. I've read the statements Mr. and Mrs. Rosie had gave to the police that they heard what they thought were animal noises behind the house, but when they opened the back door, they heard humans screaming as well. They saw a large, dark shape in the night, but only for a second before they saw my body slumped over, my fingers barely making it to the property. They had called 911 and then my parents. The ambulance that brought my brother and the other driver to the hospital had only arrived 30 minutes before mine did. My dad had run to the Rosy house while my poor, confused, and frantic mother rode to the hospital with Cammie and our neighbor. When my dad and I recently recalled the events of that night, I cried hearing the usual of funny and goofy man choke up her memory, seeing me slumped over Mrs. Rosie like a rag doll, her white robe covered in red. He said that my face was so bruised and swollen that he thought an animal had mauled me. Well, he wasn't exactly wrong. Mr. Rossi had stood guard with the bat until the police and the EMTs had all arrived. Animal control didn't press me too hard. In fact, the vaguer and foggier my memory was, the happier they seemed. I knew that if I told the truth, I would be locked up, medicated, or assumed to be a victim of something else. A monster woman from the sky... And before I even tried to say it out loud, I knew better and I feigned a memory loss. To this day, the official story is two cars on Pondside were struck by a wild animal, and the passenger of one of the cars was attacked and dragged by the animal until the neighbor had heard the commotion and fired a gun, scaring the animal off. While I was in the hospital, a handful of flowers, candles, and teddy bears were left at the stop sign. Charlie doesn't remember anything. He says the last thing he can recall is running to the car in the parking lot and turning the heat on, before pulling the car around for me. I'm actually happy this is the last thing that he remembers, but I wonder if he's telling the truth. Cammy would come in my room at night for years and she would sit on the floor next to my bed, with her fuzzy Disney blanket draped over her shoulders. She knew the whole story from beginning to end even about Mason a detail that I had kept from my parents. Cam and I would stay up together until the sun came up, our eyes locked on the window of my room, the one facing south. Some nights, she would get in bed with me, both of us sitting with our backs against the wall, our shoulders resting on one another's, both of us looking at the window. 
scanning every inch of the gray-blue pitch fading to flint every morning, searching for a growing speck of black. My parents, a proud pacifist, had purchased a gun each, and a few years later, they had Cammy and I in judo classes. But the best thing they did was believe me. Even that first night after the first surgery, they had listened intently, never interrupting or telling me that I was imagining things or lying. However, it was made very clear that while our home was a safe space, we weren't to talk about it outside its walls. I know that she's still out there, and I know Mason is too. Even after I moved away, my mom would send newspaper articles, first clippings in the mail and then eventually links and messages as time went on. Police blotters about animal activity, missing dogs, unexplained accidents, and missing blonde boys. She took one every few years from different areas, and I thought initially maybe she had killed or eaten Mason once he was too old, until I saw them both one night. I had heard that whistle and I didn't even need to look up, but I did. But that's a story for another time. I moved into the abandoned apartment complex, which the locals called Angel Trace Park at the edge of town. No one had lived there for decades. Even addicts and homeless people avoided it like the plague. I never understood it, but I wasn't questioning my luck. I lost my job and was literally penniless. I didn't even have enough spare change to ride the bus around town. I was able to get food from the food bank and find a good Samaritan or two to bum a few cigarettes from. But other than that, I was living the life of a monk. I had a backpack with a few spare clothes in it, a toothbrush, a toothpaste, and soap, some ID, a pocket knife, and that was it. I had spent a week at Angel Trace without incident. On the seventh day, I began to realize that something was wrong. It was summertime, the crickets were buzzing outside of the window, a fresh smelling breeze flowing in through the broken windows of Angel Trace. I used my backpack as a pillow in the corner and I fell asleep. I had explored the entire complex and carefully chosen an apartment in the back of the floor with only one exit and entrance so that nobody could sneak up on me to rob me, or worse. Sometimes the homeless around here were beaten up just for fun, and the police almost never did anything about it. The broken windows of the bedroom allowed wisps of light to flow through, allowing me to see silhouettes but nothing more substantial than that. As I slept, I kept feeling something softly tickling my cheeks and my forehead, my hair, but every time I stirred and looked around, I saw nothing. I hoped that it was in spiders, vigorously rubbing at my face in case one had landed on me. I felt around my backpack for a flashlight, turned it on, and immediately began to scream. Someone stood before me, their face appearing to melt and liquefy. I saw their eyes changing from blue to brown to green their pupils dilating and constricting rapidly as they stared down at me. Their flesh over their cheeks had formed into a beautiful woman and then reformed into an old man with wrinkled skin before changing to the face of a small child. It was as if a thousand faces were all shifting and appearing in the mass of melting skin, quickly showing the bones and muscle underneath before changing to the next shape. I immediately began to push against the hardwood floor with my legs, rapidly scooting back away from the creature. In the process, I dropped the flashlight and it began to twirl on the floor, sending dancing silhouettes and strobing shadows on the walls. By the time that I had picked it up again and focused it on the spot where I had seen the melting bean, the monstrosity was gone. And then the flashlight shut off a twanging sound echoing across the room as something in it broke, and I was plunged back into darkness. 
I heard heavy, creaking footsteps as something approached. An overwhelming weight descended upon my chest, and I started thrashing and screaming. I felt fingers shoved in my mouth, fingers whose skin seemed to melt off, as if decomposing under a strong acid. I tasted the rancid skin, the copper and iron of blood, and a deeper and more foul taste that overpowered all of it. A taste like meat that had been left out to rot in the summer sun for weeks on end. Shh, don't struggle so, my child. A wheezy and decrepit voice said in my ear, blowing the smell of decay directly next to my face. I started to gag, thrashing with all my might to push the thing off me, but it felt like I was fighting a mountain. It may feel bitter to die, but in the end, it is the sweetest thing of all. Terrified and furious, I reached up at the thing's face, frantically clawing at its skin. It came off in chunks, sticking to my hand and sliding down my arm and wrist in warm, wet trails. Finally, I felt one of its eyes and using all my strength, I shoved my thumb into it. The thing on top of me screamed so loudly that I thought my eardrums would burst, but it didn't sound human. It sounded more like a plane engine revving up in a deafening cacophony that shook the floors. In an instant, I was free, taken in deep gasps of sweet air, the suffocating fear that had enveloped me slowly receding. I grabbed around for the flashlight, finding it on the floor nearby. I tried turning it on again, but no light came out. I began to feel around my pockets, finding a lighter and flicking it. After a couple of flicks, the flame shot out. The thing was gone, but some melting flesh-colored substance still dripped off of my fingers. Pieces of teeth and bone littered the floor. I could see a random eyeball stuck to the floor by a tacky liquid and next to pieces of blackened and rotten intestines. All I could hear in the silence was my own heavy breathing, the pounding of my heart and the faint cries of the bugs outside. Nothing else stirred or moved. I shone the lighter around but whatever had attacked me had disappeared. I have to get out of here, I said softly to myself. This is all wrong, this place feels evil. But I didn't leave. I was tired and had nowhere to go in the middle of the night. I took a pocket knife out of my backpack and kept it in my hand, in case I got attacked again. Within a few minutes, fatigue had overpowered me and I had fallen back asleep, resting my head on my backpack and staring at the single pane of light that shone through the broken window. When I awoke, it was morning. All signs of the attack the previous night were gone. There was no melted flesh in the floor, no bone fragments, no remnants of the monster at all. Even my fingers and hands were clean. Daylight poured in and drove all the horrors of the nighttime away. I assumed that I had simply had an extremely vivid nightmare. I had heard of cases where people had sleep paralysis and thought that someone or something was standing on their chest and suffocating them. It seemed to fit exactly with my experience of the previous night. I spent the rest of the day panhandling, going to soup kitchens to get my meals and walking around the park and exploring the local library. I did not want to be homeless forever. It was a terrible life, full of cold, heat, fear, hunger, and thirst. But worst of all of that was the hopelessness of my situation. I felt that I couldn't get a job without getting an apartment. And how could I possibly afford housing without a job? I couldn't focus on a relationship or friendships because I was too worried about the lack of money, housing, and transportation that I had. So my life felt constantly meaningless and lonely. It felt like that I was stuck in some endless catch-22, and without family or friends nearby to help me out, it seemed that I had few options to get back on my feet. 
I contacted social services about potential help securing work and housing. And before I knew it, the sun was setting again. Sighing, I began to walk back to Angel Trace. As the sun faded behind the complex, sending red spikes through the clouds, I took in the scenery around the abandoned building. The trees and bushes near all seemed dead, their leaves gone and their branches dry and cracking. The building itself soared over 20 stories in the air, reminding me of some ancient Mayan pyramid for sacrificing captured prisoners. It had a slight, pyramidal shape and was the gray, lifeless color of concrete. Most of its windows were smashed. I looked at the upper stories and saw a face peering down at me from the 13th floor. It was far away, but as I squinted and tried to capture all the details that I could, I saw the thing staring down at me had skin melting off of its grinning face, all of its teeth shone along with the bone from its lower skull and making its smile stretch from ear to ear. Sir, a man asked from a bench to my right. I jumped, having not seen him. I had been so totally focused on the building that I would have walked right past him. He wore all black and sat in the shadow of a group of oak trees. He looked ancient, at least 90, with a face like a sad and wrinkled bulldog. His eyes were hidden under countless folds and he sniffed constantly. It looked like a strong breeze might blow him off the bench. Do you live here? He said in a trembling and low voice. He pointed to Angel Trace with a shaky finger. Yes, I do. I said, seeing no point in lying to this old man. I'm looking to pay somebody who knows the complex inside and out. He had said, I'm looking for a special area to do a ritual. This place the locals say is cursed and I need the presence of something unusual, something powerful. Maybe somewhere where people tend to see beings that are not of this world or feel the presence like someone is watching you. Would you know any places in the complex like that? My heart stopped as he looked up at me. It was as if he knew what had happened to me the previous night. Something happened to me in the backmost room on the 13th floor just last night, I said. I think something is living there, something not human. Remembering the mountain decaying fingers being shoved in my mouth, I shuddered. Oh, this place was terrible when people used to live here. The old man said, giving a wary sideways glance to the Angel Trace building. I've lived in this town my entire life, and we used to hear constant rumors about the goings on there. Apparently, it was full of nefarious activity, and the worst types of it too. The police were constantly being called in there, to the point where the city wanted to shut it all down permanently. But it wasn't until Jeremiah Lands ended himself on the 13th floor that this place really began to get, let's say, out of control. I shuddered inwardly. Everyone around here knew the story of Jeremiah Lands, the serial killer who had claimed at least seven women. I knew that he used to dispose of their bodies in the nearby river, so the media began calling him the Mapoho River Slasher. Eventually, police got a break in the case when they saw his license plate on some security camera and the same block where the last victim had disappeared on her way home from high school. I got a search warrant and started breaking down the door of his apartment in Angel Trays, but he started shooting through the door with shotgun slugs, taking out two police officers before putting the gun to himself and ending it. My God, I said more to myself than the old man. His apartment was on the 13th floor. My heart fluttered in my chest as I put together the connections. Yes, sir, the old man said. The last apartment on the right side. I knew it, I muttered. That was where I was, where I saw something, something horrible. I wondered if Jeremiah Lance had anything to do with the melting shadow creature that I had encountered the previous night 
if indeed that hadn't just been a nightmare. Maybe his ghost was upset that I was sleeping in the room where he had spent his final moments and taken his final stand. By the way, the old man said, reaching out his hand. My name is Henry. I'm looking for some help in Angel Trace and I'm willing to pay quite handsomely. I think you're the only one qualified to help me. He took out a wad of cash from his inner coat pocket. 2000 in cash if you show me exactly where this event happened to you and give me some minor help with the ritual that I'm planning tonight. My eyes widened at the money in front of me. I could potentially use that money for a security deposit and maybe get out of his constant cycle of homelessness and joblessness. My name is Dimitri, I said, shaking his hand and feeling the small, bird-like bones beneath his skin. Man, you have a deal. As the last rays of sun disappeared, we walked into the musty entrance of the complex. The noises and smells of summer had faded behind us as we walked up the staircase to the 13th floor. The entire building smelled like dust, decaying wood, and mold. By the time we got to the apartment of Jeremiah Lands, I took out my new flashlight to get our way. The sunlight had all but disappeared in with no nearby street lamps. Only the light of the full moon shone through the broken windows. Henry quickly assembled his materials for the ritual, drawing a seven-pointed star across the entire floor of the room with blood. I didn't ask what kind of it it was or where he had got it. Some questions might be better left unasked. He lit 13 black candles around the star, claiming that the candles had cremated human remains mixed in with the wax. And then he got down on his knees in the center of the star and started chanting in a language that I had never heard before. It almost sounded like Hebrew or Arabic, but I knew a little of each and I could tell that it wasn't either. Without a word or a moment of hesitation, he took out a dagger from his pocket and sliced his left hand wide open, letting the flood of red pool in the center of the star. He started chanting faster and louder, and I saw with horror that his blood was reforming itself into a cataract covered eye on the floor. It looked quickly around in all directions, its mucky pupil dilating rapidly. The chanting stopped, but the room was humming, as if with thousands of electrical power lines overhead. It felt hard to breathe, like the room was closing in around me. And then, within the space of a moment, the humming stopped and all craziness broke loose. Outside the windows, I saw endless insectoid eyes all the way to the horizon. They flitted rapidly, looking in all directions. As I drew closer, I realized the building was surrounded by millions of massive buzzing monstrosities. Dragonflies the size of airplanes flew through the sky, their blood-red eyes coldly regarding the earth below. A black, faded-smelling stream now ran directly beneath the window. Scorpions and snakes continuously crawled out of it, their stingers and fangs looking like swords, their gargantuan bodies moving unbelievably fast, blurring across the ground. I heard countless overlapping screams and saw thousands of people constantly being stung by these scorpions or bitten by the snakes. Their bodies swelled and turned to purple and blue, their throats closing from the effects of the poison. But as soon as they had stopped thrashing and died, their injuries all miraculously healed themselves. They would rise up again, screaming and gagging, until the new horror overtook them. Where are we? I asked myself as I looked into the alien world outside. There were no stars in the sky, no moon, just an endless, inky gray sheet above us. I knew that we weren't on Earth anymore. This is the place where the insane dream and the gods of old drink the blood of the lambs. 
Henry said in a hoarse voice behind me, choking and gasping for breath. I turned around and saw that the seven-pointed star had disappeared, as if the hardwood floor had simply drunk up every drop of blood and left no trace. The eye that had been in the floor in the center of the room now belonged to a tall, eldritch abomination. It stood over ten feet tall, its single milky eye constantly searching, its body pure black and shining, like the skin of a poisonous snake. Its mouth opened, unhinging and dropping nearly to the floor, and it began to speak in a buzzing, insectile voice. Its word had no changes in cadence or pitch, and an almost robotic emotionless quality to them. Thirsty, it said in a monotone voice. Henry Lands, let me drink. It spoke his name as if it were one word. Henry raised his still gushing hand, standing up slowly in the monstrosity, put its mouth underneath, letting small rivulets of blood rush into his mouth. They are welcoming the queen home, Henry said cryptically as the creature drank his blood. As my anxiety and terror rose, I backed away from them as far as I could, going to the corner of the room and trying not to look out the window. I just wanted this bizarre ritual to be over. I mean, what was his endgame in all of this? Why did he need me to be with him? It felt like I wouldn't like the answers to the questions that I asked myself. Wait, I said, fear and horror overwhelming me. Did he call you Henry Lands, as in the father of Jeremiah Lands? Henry smiled at me. Red began to flow out of his nose and eyes as his frail body quivered next to the monstrous creature. I am giving myself to bring my son back. His mission was not yet completed. We needed only one more victim to break through this illusion and open up the doorway to the true world beyond. You see it now before you just as my son and I did at the beginning. He raised the dagger to his throat, coughing up a few droplets before putting it underneath his right ear. And I am the last victim. I give myself to you, my son. Henry cried out quickly cutting his throat from ear to ear. The dagger was so sharp that, for a moment, it didn't even look like there was any separation in his skin. And then his entire head began to fall backwards, held on by only a thin layer of muscle, skin, and bone. Red poured like a waterfall over the front of his chest, soaking his shirt instantly. The creature throbbed with excitement and energy as its one blind eye looked down on Henry's body. With an insectile voice it cried, Your sacrifice is worthy, my father. Worthy is the lamb, but how much greater is the dragon that consumes the world? I've always loved you, father, and what I do now I do for us to bring the truth to those without eyes. It opened a gaping maw with hundreds of shark-like teeth, kneeling down in front of his father's body and sucking all the blood from his spurting neck. I saw a look of complete and total peace in Henry's eyes as this demonic spirit of his son ate his remaining life force. He looked like a saint who had died knowing heaven is only seconds away. But there was something twisted and unnatural about the peace that radiated from his eyes. Within seconds, the body began to wither and dry up like a husk. I could see the blood being pulled out of his veins and arteries, the thin old skin pressing in on itself under the pressure as the sun finished consuming the last few drops of vital life essence given to him by his father. The body of the thing that had once been Jeremiah Lands vibrated with shimmering electricity, raising the hairs on my arms. Come to us, queen, 
He said his voice, growing louder and stronger as he spoke. The insects welcome you home. From outside the window, a booming voice began to roar. I looked out the window and saw a dragon there, its skin fiery red, its huge black eyes staring into the window as it spoke. I am the first and the last, it said, making my ears ring from the sheer force of its voice. The Alpha and the Omega, and this world is mine. We shall fill the oceans with the blood of the believers. Open the portal, Jeremiah, and let us bring a new world to humanity. Jeremiah walked over to the broken window and began smashing the wall open with his fist, using his superhuman speed and strength to knock the wood out. It flew down 13 stories, clattering on the sidewalk below. And as I looked through it, I realized that I was no longer solely in the alien world of that ritual. I could see the buildings of the town, the streets, and the streetlights, along with countless people rushing out of their houses and yelling in panic as they stared up at the red dragon and the thousands of huge insects, snakes and scorpions that rapidly descended upon them. The sky had returned to the one that I knew, with stars and a full moon shining brightly, but the swarms of flying monsters soon blocked out all of it. I heard countless alarms in police cars in the distance, and the wail of what sounded like a tornado siren. The town had certainly begun to notice what was going on, and they were rightly terrified beyond belief. As I looked out the broken wall, I saw tiny figures in the distance, carried off by huge dragonflies, bitten in half by giant stakes or stung by scorpions the size of a buzz. The queen dragon welcomes you, Jeremiah said, turning his thrumming body towards me and looking down at me with a single milky eye. Will you take the mark of the beast? Only those who follow the queen and have her mark will be free from these stinging horrors. Jeremiah showed me his hand, where a seven-pointed star was engraved into his palm, red light shining out of it as if illuminated by an inner fire. I looked around at all the people dying and the screams fading away, and I knew that I had no choice. I ran. I knew the Angel Tree's complex better than anyone, and it saved me. Jeremiah sprinted after me, but my head started to my knowledge of the twists and turns of its dilapidated halls. Let me escape him within a couple of minutes. I ran down the floors heading to the basement. I hid in an old industrial elevator lift that had been built into the structure, slamming the metal door shut behind me and hiding in my own private bunker. I hid in there for what felt like days. As the thirst and hunger began to weaken me, I knew that I either had to leave or die. I left, walking slowly up the stairs and peering out the front door. Bodies were strewn all across the streets, but the monsters and the red dragon were gone. There was no sign of Jeremiah Lands. I walked throughout the town and saw only a few living people, all having a seven-pointed star carved into the palm of their left hand. They smiled at me, but none of them said anything. I raided the local grocery store, grabbing food and bottled water, stepping over the bodies of people and their parents as I stuffed whatever I could into my pockets, and then I set out for the border of the town. I saw a perimeter of military vehicles, the bodies of soldiers strewn over the roads, many of them cut in half or swollen to twice their normal size, their bodies infested with unknown alien poisons. There was not a single police officer or soldier left alive that I saw. I tried to keep my eyes down, avoiding the chaos that surrounded me. 
and I ended up cutting through the woods, walking for over 10 miles until I had reached the next town over. There, everything seemed normal. Though government agents manned checkpoints on all the roads leading into the town, where Angel Trace was located. Police in SWAT gear and gas masks held rifles every few feet on the road, and they appeared to glance nervously around. I stopped an elderly woman walking out of the nearby restaurant and said hello to her, and then I asked her what was going on. She smiled at me. Oh, it looks like the next town over had some sort of chemical plant explosion, she said. The entire area is quarantined. The U.S. military is everywhere, stopping everyone who heads in that direction. I wondered where the Red Dragon had gone and where Jeremiah Lance and all those creatures from the alien world had headed. They were now in our world and I knew they couldn't be contained for long. As I looked down at the old woman's hand, I saw a seven-pointed star carved into her hand and red light shining out and giving her smile a bloody glow. But I think we both know better, she said to me, leaning close. The end is near, my son. Will you come and see? My great-grandfather fought during World War I as an infantry man in the British Army. I grew up hearing tales of the Great War passed down from my great-grandfather to my grandparents, to my parents, and then to me. I remember being told about how my great-grandfather had earned a Distinguished Conduct Medal for manning a Vickers machine gun all by himself to cover a retreat after the original crew were slain by an enemy rifleman. They told me that he once tossed a German potato masher grenade right back into no man's land only seconds before it had detonated. I remember looking at an old black and white photograph of him as a young man shortly after the war and noticing the eye patch which obscured the scarred hole left behind from a German stormtrooper's knife. About a week ago, I was going through my grandmother's things after she had passed away and I stumbled across a slim, leather-bound notebook. Opening the cover, I noticed that the first page was signed with my great-grandfather's name. I read the entire manuscript in a matter of an hour or so. It wasn't particularly long and what was contained within it was so bizarre that I couldn't help but read it cover to cover. What follows is a transcription of my great-grandfather's journal, mildly edited for my own privacy. Names and certain other minor details have been slightly altered and or changed, so as to avoid any unscrupulous individuals using this information to find out who I am. My name is Raymond Phillips and what I'm about to describe I have never written down nor told anyone about before now. I'm an old man and I'm afraid that I don't have long on this earth. I do not fear death, God knows I've faced it countless times, but I do fear the loss of knowledge that my demise may bring about. During my service in the British Army from 1916 until my honorable discharge in 1918, I had three separate horrifying experiences which are permanently seared into my memory like a brand upon skin. I'm afraid I cannot provide these specific dates for these events, as I did not enter them into my diary when they occurred, and time washes away from memory all things not safely recorded in ink or drama. As a younger man, I convinced myself that they were mere delusions, the product of some brain fever brought on by the rigors of combat. With the certainty of age, however, comes clarity, and the understanding that what happened to me was real. My first experience with what some may call the paranormal occurred at some point in 1916. At that time, the war on the Western Front was at a bit of a stalemate, with neither side gaining much ground over the other. I found myself stationed in the trenches of northeastern France, 
It was while that we were moving in to relieve the troops at the front line that I got the first hint of what was to come. As we were getting settled in, I took notice of a young man in a stretcher. He was gibbering and yelling quite loudly about those horrible infernal rats and seemed to be thrashing about rather intensely. Looking closer, I noticed that he was strapped down, with wild eyes staring out desperately. At the time, I assumed it was some strange form of shell shock. In any event, I got myself all settled in for the up-and-coming days of tense boredom which characterized one's stay at the front lines. There was never enough to do to occupy one's time, but at the same time you could never truly relax, not in a place like that. The infrequent sounds of gunfire and artillery made staying calm a Herculean feat. It was nearly always cold and damp, with rats scurrying underfoot. While the verminous little beasties were far from pleasant, I still didn't quite understand how they could frighten the chap in the stretcher so badly. Not when there were so many other more practical horrors which could occupy one's mind. Even on the quietest of days you would need to keep your wits about you. Death was always nearby. There were almost daily casualties, one or two men dying from disease, artillery, or a well-placed shot from a German rifle on the other side of no man's land. The bodies of the dead when we could safely recover them were stacked up in a relatively unused portion of the trench and covered with a blanket. They would remain there until such time as they could receive some form of proper burial. Standing guard in that particular area was obviously not a very enviable position. I found myself on guard duty one night, relatively isolated from the rest of the men. Nobody ever slept too close to the corpse piles, so I didn't even have an unconscious companion to break the stillness with snoring. I was alone, with only the distant roar of artillery and a pile of the dead to keep me company. As I stood there, cigarette in one hand and rifle in the other, I began to hear the sound of faint digging, as if mud was being moved aside with a small trowel. I looked around for the source of the noise, wondering if it was just my imagination or God forbid, the Germans were tunneling into our trench. Extinguishing my cigarette in the damp mud, I readied my rifle and affixed its bayonet preparing myself to fight and sound the alarm if need be. As I peered about the trench, I noticed a hint of movement from under the blanket which obscured the bodies of the dead. The sound of digging continued and my heart began to thump louder in my chest as I approached its source. Very gently using my bayonet, I lifted the edge of the blanket. As I did so, I caught a glimpse of the rotting, disfigured face of the man beneath it and I had to look away for a moment to ratch. When I composed myself, I looked again and saw with horror that the body appeared to be moving slightly. My face went pale as I grew worried about the possibility that the dead man may be awakening, until I realized that the corpse was being pulled towards the side of the trench, as if somebody within the wall was grasping it by the ankles to drag it into some unseen tunnel. Determined now, I lifted the blanket off the pile entirely, aiming my rifle towards what I thought was the source of the digging sound and the corpse's movement. I gasped in abject horror as I saw a pair of sharp-tipped claws extending out of the trench wall from a crudely dug hole, and grabbing hold of the corpse with both hands. I was shaking with fright, causing me to miss my shot at the beast and hit one of the bodies instead causing a splash of coagulated red to spray out of the bullet hole. There was a monstrous screech as though the sound of some overgrown rodent, and the claws retreated back into the hole, the makeshift tunnel collapsing as it did so. I stood careful watch over the corpse pile for the rest of my shaft, listening intently for any sounds of scratching or digging, but none came. Nobody questioned the gunshot the day after, as we were all fairly used to gunfire by night in the trenches, and so I gave no explanation for it. 
I would like to say that was my only encounter with one of those vile creatures, but I did have one more a few weeks after the first. One of the officers got it into his head that we ought to sneak across no man's land by night and conduct a small trench raid. A few unfortunate lads, including myself, were assigned to the raid, and at around midnight, we went marching out towards the German trench under the cover of darkness. And we were about halfway through no man's land when one of my comrades, a chap by the name of Corporal Douglas, I believe, was shot in the chest by a German sniper. As he fell, spluttering and coughing, I ducked down to the ground looking for cover. I found it in the form of a small crater, evidently formed from an artillery shell detonation. I dragged Douglas into the crater as I heard the chatter of machine gun fire meld with the screams of the dying. Evidently, either the German army was more attentive than we had expected, or we weren't nearly so stealthy as we thought. I took a look at the wound, paying no mind to raise my head over the edge of our makeshift shelter. It looked bad, worse than the simple soldier like myself had any chance to mend. But still, I did what I could. I poured a bit of whiskey from Douglas's hip flask onto the bullet hole and giving the rest to him to drink. And then using my knife, I cut a strip of cloth from my tunic into a makeshift bandage, wrapping it around the wound to keep some pressure on it and to staunch the flow of blood. All the while, as I worked on caring for Corporal Douglas's injury, my ears were assaulted with a sound of gunfire and shrieks of agony. I tuned it out as best as I could, focusing on what could be done rather than the all-pervading death which surrounded us. Eventually, after some minutes, the sounds of combat had stopped. I surmised that one of two things had occurred. Either our lads had reached the German trench and slain the defenders, or that the bodies of my fallen comrades were currently enriching the soil with their own spilt blood. Taking off my helmet, I placed it on the end of my rifle and extended it upwards into the sky, just barely peeking over the edge of the crater. In an instant, the helmet went flying off into the darkness with a resounding clang as the report of a German rifle echoed in the distance. Evidently, Douglas and I were pinned down. Douglas had been silent throughout this whole business save for the occasional gurgle or groan of pain. I figured the poor chap was in shock, given the extent of his injury. I wish that I had a blanket or some kind to give him. I had read somewhere about that being an effective remedy in these circumstances. With nothing else to be done, I lit a cigarette and I began to smoke, trying to steady my frayed nerves. I offered one to Douglas, but he didn't seem to even notice it. He just continued staring straight ahead while wheezing. A few hours must have passed, and it must have been perhaps two or three o'clock in the morning, when I heard the sound of claws digging through dirt and mud. That familiar noise sent a shiver up my spine, and I peered around the crater, rifle at the ready. It was rather difficult to see purely by moonlight, but I noticed some earth crumbling at the far end of the crater. Raising my rifle to my shoulder, I aimed for the spot and pulled the trigger. I was greeted with a quiet click. Panicking, I ejected the cartridge and cycled a new one into the chamber, hoping that it was merely a problem with the ammunition rather than the gun's mechanism. Once again I aimed and squeezed the trigger, praying. A faint click emanated from the weapon, and nothing else happened. Cursing, I tossed the rifle aside, looking around for some other weapon which to defend Douglas and myself. I, of course, had my knife, but having seen the claws of that thing in the trench, I had no desire to try my luck in hand-to-hand -hand combat. I could see its claws emerging from the ground, sharp and rodent-like. Finally, my eyes landed on the corporal's revolver, and I swiftly grabbed it from the holster and fired a shot towards the unholy beast. Thankfully, the sidearm was in perfectly good working condition, and the projectile struck true. There was an awful shriek, 
something like a cross between a rat's squeak and the wailing of a man in pain, and the claws fell limp. Though I still couldn't see the thing's face buried in the mud, evidently I had correctly guessed its position, and I put the thing out of its misery. I clapped Corporal Douglas on the shoulder and I whooped in glee, but my celebration proved to be short-lived. Scarcely had the expression of joy left my lips when, I heard the sound of tunneling once again, this time to my right. I aimed the pistol at the sound of the disturbed earth and I waited. My hands were shaking through a combination of adrenaline and fear, so it was difficult to steady my aim. I decided to wait until I could see the whites of my unseen foe's eyes, so as to assure the best shot possible. As it turned out, the creature that emerged from the dirt didn't have eyes. A snout covered in greasy, pockmarked skin popped out of the earth, snuffling as it began to pull the rest of its bulk through the crude tunnel with its enormous claws. It was roughly man-shaped, resembling some sort of quadrupedal ape, though in overall appearance it suggested nothing so much as an overgrown mangy rat. A set of sharp, jagged incisors extended out from his lips as it continued to sniff the air, evidently looking for food. After several seconds, I finally regained my composure enough to pull the trigger. Unfortunately, in my panic, I unloaded not one, but five rounds into the beast, only stopping when Corporal Douglas's revolver ran out of ammunition. I continued pulling the trigger long after the beast had howled its death cry and slumped to the ground motionless. Exhausted and under considerable mental strain, I finally put down the revolver and pulled out my cigarettes yet again, though the shaking in my hands made lighting one fairly difficult. It must have been a half hour or so after I shot the thing that the digging had started up again. This time I heard it from all around me. I grabbed it once more for the corporal's pistol before realizing that it was still out of ammunition. Panicking, I rummaged about at his belt, looking for his speed loader. Corporal Douglas continued his heavy, gurgling breathing, still completely unresponsive. It took me a few moments to notice the corpse of the thing that I had shot earlier being dragged back down into the hole from whence it came. Either the things had some sort of burial ritual for their dead, or more likely they possessed no moral objections to cannibalism. I finally found the spare ammunition and fumbled with the revolver, attempted to reload it as swiftly as possible. In my haste, I accidentally had peeked my head up slightly above the rim of the crater, and I heard the whiz of a bullet pass by inches from my ear. Quickly, I fell back down to the ground, but I dropped the speed loader in the process. Scrambling about in the mud for the fallen object, I heard digging from right next to me, from where Corporal Douglas lay. I looked up and saw a set of those awful, clawed hands pawing at him, beginning to drag him into the ground. Screaming in a combination of rage and terror, I drew my knife and attempted to stab at the vile claws, but I missed my mark, driving my knife into the dirt instead. The thin grasping Douglas reached out its claw and slashed to my arm, causing me to yelp in pain as I staggered back. Doing my best to try and stop the bleeding, I watched in terror as those awful claws pulled poor Douglas into the burrow from which they had emerged. All the while, he groaned and gurgled senselessly. I wept in horror and quite out of my mind, ran out of the crater and towards our trench. As for how I survived that perilous flight across no man's land, I have no idea. It must have been blind luck, I suppose. In any event, I awoke a few days later in a battlefield hospital screaming about rats. A doctor told me that I was suffering from some sort of brain fever, and that I should be fine after a few days of rest. Nobody asked me about Corporal Douglas, and so, like with my first encounter with those inhuman monsters, I preferred no explanation. I never met with any of those horrid creatures again, thankfully. But the war was far from over and there was plenty more time to come face to face with unimaginable horrors 
both mundane and supernatural. It was a bit over a year since my encounter with those rodent-like creatures before anything I would label as supernatural had occurred again. I'm not entirely sure of the exact month, but I'm certain that it was in the winter of 1917. In any event, things have been continuing essentially the same with constant deaths, very little ground gained, and the never-ending din of distant artillery to serve as a lullaby. During the time, I befriended another soldier by the name of Gordon Lindsay. Lindsay was a fairly jovial fellow, always quick with a joke to lighten the mood, which could have been in turn infuriating or endearing, depending upon the particulars of any given situation. I recall the particular incident in which another infantryman happened to have been shot in a rather, shall we say, sensitive area. The poor fellow was laid up in bed whereupon Lindsay walked up to him and cheerfully announced, Keep your chin up, mate. At least you've got an issue for its length now. I've never seen someone so previously immobile get up that quickly before. Gordon had a black eye for a week or two after that one. It was almost surprising to learn that Lindsay was fairly well educated, given his constant joking and manner of speech. He spoke both French and German and had been working on a degree of some sort before he was drafted. He only seemed to sober up from his pleasant, happy-go-lucky attitude whenever he heard someone on the other side of no man's land crowd in pain or fear. And to you lot, I remember him saying once, it's all just a bunch of gibberish, isn't it? Just sounds disregarded as easy as the gobbling of a turkey about to be slaughtered for a Christmas dinner. But I hear what they're saying, don't I? Hear them crying out for the mom or talking about how much it hurts. I sometimes wish I never bloody studied German. It would make killing them so much easier. I didn't know much how to respond to that statement, so I just offered him a cigarette, which he gladly took. The whole nasty business began one night when the Germans tried to surprise our trench with a nighttime raid. Lucky for us, one of the lads on watch had managed to stop them, so we were able to repel most of them before we were in bayonet range. A few of them, however, managed to get down into the trench and caused a bit of chaos. Initially, I was barely conscious, having been woken from a fitful sleep by shouts to take up arms. However, a shot whizzing by your head works wonders to clear the fog from one's mind. Firing a rifle accurately in such close quarters is no easy feat, but I managed to get a shot off at one of our attackers, striking him in the leg. The poor blighter went down screaming bloody murder, and I was glad that I couldn't understand German. I imagine the things he must have been saying about me are not suitable for repetition. Looking around, I spotted Lindsay taking aim with his rifle at one of the Germans, completely unaware that right behind him was a man with a rather nasty looking knife. I yelled out to him to turn around and to his credit he did, immediately firing a shot into his would-be attacker's gut. The fighting was over and all of the trench raiders had either been killed or had surrendered, or were otherwise incapacitated. I jogged over to Lindsay asking him if he was alright. As I reached him, I saw that he was staring at the man with the knife. Following his gaze, I looked down at the fallen soldier realizing that he wasn't quite dead. As I watched, the man made direct eye contact with Lindsay and cut his own palm with his knife. Red had poured out of the wound, but the man didn't even flinch. He just kept staring right into Lindsay's eyes, boring into his very soul. Finally, he broke the silence, murmuring out some words in German that I couldn't understand. After uttering those words, his face went blank and his eyes clotted over. The man was dead. What did he say? I asked Lindsay, who was still staring directly at the corpse. He didn't respond. And grabbing his arm, I repeated my question. Dang it, Lindsay, what did he say? Shaking his head, Lindsay managed to mutter. He said, the hound will take you in seven days. He looked away from the corpse and over to me, giving a desperate half-smile. Bit of an odd one that, in it, Phillips. Must have, must have been trying to give me a bit of a scare, don't you think? I nodded, seeing how much this was affecting him. 
There was this look of real, primal fear in his face. Now, of course, I had seen Lindsay kill people before, but he didn't like it. Only someone who was a bit sick in the head could, but I had never seen him this afraid before. Uh, it must be some sort of obscure German insult. Or maybe he was uh, just starting to lose his head. It could be anything, really, Lindsay. I wouldn't pay it too much mind. I sat, trying to reassure him. He shook his head and chucked weakly. Me didn't lose his head, you half-wit. You and I both know that I shot him squarely in the chest. Laughing, I clapped Lindsay on the shoulder and pulled him off to join the others and figure out our next move. He seemed to be mostly back to his old self for the moment. But whenever he wasn't talking or cracking jokes, I could see this distance in his eyes. Like he was still hearing the words that a German soldier had said to him. For the next three days, things were largely back to normal though I could sometimes see Lindsay staring off into space with an odd look on his face. He sometimes seemed like he was listening to some sound that I couldn't hear. I assumed he was just in a bit of a funk. Combat can do that to a fellow. It wasn't until the fourth day that anything actually strange happened. I was having a supper of tinned fish when suddenly Lindsay grabbed me by the arm and pulled me off to one side. I wasn't upset by this, as the meal was somewhat far from gourmet, but I was rather confused. <laughs> Lindsay, what's going on, old chap? What's gotten you in such a bother? I asked, standing my ground and keeping us both in place. Listen, Phillips, I have to show you something, but... He looked around, seeming to check if anybody else was around to listen. You have to promise me not to tell anyone, all right? I stared at Lindsay, getting a better look at the expression on his face. He was terrified and completely serious. I nodded and he led me to a relatively quiet area of the trench, crouched down and pointed at the muddy ground. I followed where his finger pointed and I stared for a moment, before I processed what I was looking at. Pressed into the muck were a series of paw prints, each one at least a foot in length pressing down a good five centimeters or so into the earth. Lindsay and I followed the trail of paw prints until they stopped at one of the trench walls. Peering carefully over the side, we saw the trail continue into the distant tree line. What manner of beast could leave prints like that? I muttered to myself, staring into the distant forest. Lindsay began to laugh hysterically. Well, uh, this is just bloody brilliant, isn't it? On the one hand, you can see the prints too, so I haven't gone totally barmy. On the other hand, there's a dang monster out there to get me. He began to double over with the intensity of his laughter, whooping and hollering in some sort of mania. I slapped him once or twice to try to pull him together, but it didn't work. He just kept laughing and laughing. Eventually, it grew to be too much for me, and I left him to his madness storming off to find a dry spot to try and get some sleep. All night long, I could hear him cackling to himself, even over the endless percussion of distant explosions. When I did finally get comfortable enough to get a bit of rest, I dreamt that I was being pursued through the trenches by an unseen and enormous hound. The day after his laughing fit, Lindsay had become very quiet and kept mostly to himself. Everybody had heard him having his breakdown, and most of the lads steered clear of him, worried that he had gotten a bit funny in the head. I suppose I can't properly blame them, but it still felt bad seeing the poor chap all on his own. I tried to talk to him from time to time, but he just wouldn't respond. All he would do was stare off into space. At night, sometimes I would hear a distant bane, I prayed that they were only wolves. It was seven days after the German soldier made his pronouncement when Lindsay finally spoke again. It was late that night and both of us were on watch, sharing a cigarette together in silence. Even if he wouldn't talk, Lindsay still had enough awareness to smoke. The artillery seemed a bit louder than usual that night, and every so often there would be an explosion out in no man's land that illuminated the darkness with a fiery explosion. 
I wasn't sure what the Germans were doing, but it made me nervous. I kept wondering if the next shell might strike us, that I wouldn't even have a chance to realize I was going to die before my life ended in a loud bang and a puff of smoke. Lindsay was staring off into no man's land when suddenly, very calmly, he pointed out into the distance and spoke a single word. Look. I looked out where he had indicated, straining my eyes in the pitch black of the night. I don't see anything. I started to say when suddenly an artillery shell burst, throwing light upon the scarred landscape. I saw it. Standing there amongst the ruined madness of mechanized warfare, I gazed upon the hound. It was as big as a tank and as black as smoke, with two burning red eyes gazing hungrily towards us. The thing had to be at least three meters high at the shoulder, but I can't say for sure. Ivory fangs jutted from its slavering maw, foam dripping from its lips. I felt like a mouse staring into the face of an owl or a fox gazing down the barrel of a hunter's gun. The flash of the explosion lasted only an instant before all was darkness yet again. But even in the blackness, I could still see those terrible red eyes staring towards our trench with an evil, unearthly hunger. I practically fell backwards in terror, all sense of discipline and duty overcome by the sheer horror invoked by that monstrous infernal hound. Don't be frightened, Phillips. It's not you at once, murmured Lindsay, still gazing out at the hound. Without another word, he began to climb over the edge of the trench, walking out into no man's land. He showed no fear, no trepidation. The look on his face was almost one of relief as he vanished into the dark. I scrambled over to the edge of the trench, not daring to follow him. I called out his name, begged him to come back, but he didn't even respond. Another explosion and I saw the silhouette of my friend mere meters away from the hound, getting down on his knees before it. Its mouth was open now, its slavery maw filled to the brim with dagger-like fangs. Lindsay! I screamed, tears flowing down my face. The brief light from the explosion was swallowed up by the night. I waited for another explosion, each second feeling like hours. Finally another detonated and it lit up no man's land. But there was nothing there. There was no more hound, no more Lindsay. Not so much as a corpse or a pile of shredded clothing. In the far, far distance, I could hear a low and savage howl. Officially, Private Gordon Lindsay had deserted the British Army. They never found a body and there was no record of his death, so that would be the natural assumption. But I know the truth. Even now, nearly half a century later, I cannot abide the bane of hounds. Unlike my great-grandfather's first encounter, black dogs and hounds are well attested in folklore with quite a number of sightings all throughout Europe. There are even a few alleged encounters along the Western Front. I looked into official records regarding Private Lindsay's disappearance and was able to confirm that he was reported to have deserted the British Army in 1917. Beyond that, the rest is impossible to verify. I shall transcribe and post the final entry in my great-grandfather's journal shortly. Unlike the rather considerable gap between my encounters with those carnivorous rat things and that awful ordeal with the hound, my final experience with the weird occurred less than a year after the previous one. It was the fall of 1918 and it was becoming apparent that the war was nearing its natural conclusion. How soon victory would come, nobody knew, but there was a somewhat renewed sense of vigor about us all, perhaps partially due to the torrential flood of fresh American troops. In any event, as the war progressed, tanks became a much more common sight in the battlefield. I was no stranger to them by this point, having seen quite a few of them trundling their way across no man's land. But as time went on, they became more and more numerous. I even got to witness some tank-on-tank -tank battles a handful of times, 
And I dare say in some ways that it was more horrifying to see those enormous steel brutes fight it out than anything supernatural. My final brush with the supernatural began during one of the aforementioned tank battles. I was hiding behind some rubble as the thundering of naval guns filled my ears. The percussive sound occasionally disrupted with the staccato of machine gun fire. The Germans had brought a handful of captured MK4s to fight off her own and the level of violence was astounding, even for someone as inured to bloodshed as I was. Oftentimes it felt that for us infantrymen we would spend more time hiding than trying to disable the things. I had peeped over the edge of my makeshift concealment to rifle at the ready, looking around for any opponents not currently protected by steel plates. There were only four or five of the German tanks, more than outnumbered by our own, but what they lacked in numbers they more than made up for in brutality. As I surveyed the war-torn ruins, I spotted a grey German war machine opened fire on one of our own tanks with a tremendous boom of its six-pounder. When the smoke cleared, I could see that the British tank seemed to have been stopped dead in its tracks, fire licking out of the charred husk. I had a split second to notice the German tank's machine gun aim in my direction, and I ducked down behind the rubble once again. The chatter of the tank's machine gun quieted down after a few seconds of whizzing bullets, and I suddenly became horribly aware of how easily my makeshift cover could be blown to pieces by the tank's larger gun. I looked for an exit, noticing a slightly sturdier looking bit of cover a few meters away. Deciding to chance it, I ran out from behind the rubble, sprinting at full speed. A tremendous explosion from directly behind me made my ears ring, and I was carried into the air by the force of the shockwave, falling upon the ruined ground. Stunned, I could only gaze feebly as I watched the steel juggernaut approach my prone form. Seemingly, they planned on saving ammunition by simply crushing me to death beneath the tank's treads. As I stared helplessly at my oncoming doom, the ruined husk of the British tank started to move again, the barrel of one of its six pounders aiming at the rear of my would-be executioner. The gun fired and there was an enormous earth-shuddering boom, so loud that I could hear it even rippling through my ears. The tank that I was sure would kill me had ceased all motion and I blacked out, presumably from the rather nasty knock on the head that I had received only moments prior. When I awoke, I was still on the ground, covered in dust and bits of rubble. I stood up, rubbing the large knot on the back of my head. Luckily, aside from a terrible headache, I seemed none the worse for wear. The sounds of fighting had ceased and nobody shot me after I had stood back up, so I figured the battle must have been over. I went looking for the rest of the lads, and as I made my search, I noticed dozens upon dozens of corpses, both Germans and our chaps, some of whom were crushed into paste under the weight of tank treads. I shuddered as I thought of what could have happened had the tank not fired when it did. Eventually, I finally saw the rest of the company who seemed to be chattering on quite excitedly about something. As I approached, I began to hear more clearly what they were talking about. Do you reckon the driver went mad? Good lord, I swear it took out as many of us as it did the Germans. One man had asked, a look of horror on his face. It couldn't have just been the driver, the whole crew had to have been in on it. Otherwise, why would the machine guns have mowed down everything in sight? Said another, his arms in a sling. I could have sworn that I saw it get taken down earlier. A direct hit from a German tank. There's no way that anyone could have survived that added a third man as he lit a cigarette. As I was about to ask what they were talking about, an officer, Sergeant Bentley I believe was his name, blew his whistle, and we all stood at attention on instinct. Alright gentlemen, that's quite enough chit chat, said Sergeant Bentley. Just because we've won the battle doesn't mean that we have time to stand around and gossip. Now as most of you are probably aware, it seems as if one of our tank crews got a bit, shall we say, overzealous. Overzealous, they went berserk, cried out one of the men breaking the silence. Quiet, shouted Bentley, staring daggers at the speaker. As I was saying, they seemed to have gotten a bit carried away in the heat of battle, 
and there were a few incidents of friendly fire. Now that tank seems to have run off, as it were, out into the forest. We assume that the crew feels guilty for what they've done, and they've chosen to try and flee the consequences of their actions. Therefore, I'm sending a small team to try and track down the blighters. Many volunteers. I don't know why I raised my hand, but to this day, I generally don't really have the foggiest idea. But raise it I did, and before I knew it, I and a few of the other lads were out trudging through the forest, following a trail of crushed undergrowth and knocked over trees. As we first entered the forest, we could still hear sounds of combat in the far distance. However, as we proceeded further into the woods, the faraway thunder of artillery grew quieter and quieter, until we were surrounded entirely by silence. After so much violence and so much noise, silence can become more disturbing than the din of active combat. To our shaken minds, every snapped twig was an approaching soldier's footfalls, each gust of wind the whispering of orders in a foreign tongue, and every creaking tree was a tank's engine. And we proceeded with painful slowness, stopping frequently whenever anything even hinted at the remoteness possibility of an ambush. After about a half hour, we began to hear the sound of a rumbling engine through the intense silence. We slowed our pace even further, and crept carefully towards the noise, making sure to be as quiet as possible. After a few minutes, we spotted our quarry. The tank seemed to have gotten stuck in a ditch of some sort. Ordinarily, a problem like that would only take minutes to solve just requiring the crew to get out and use an unditching beam to get the vehicle out. Given how comparatively quickly tanks can move, even through the roughest of terrain, it didn't make sense why they would just leave the tank there long enough for us to catch up. They must have gotten out and continued on foot, just left the tank here with the engine running. One of my comrades had observed getting out from behind cover and stepping towards the immobilized war machine. As he began to stand up, the hairs in the back of my neck stood on end, and I instinctively began to shout, Get back here, man! But it was too late. As soon as he had left the obscuring cover of the brush, one of the machine gun barrels pointed towards the man and let loose a stream of lead and death. Once the telltale chatter of the machine gun had reached the ears of the other men, panic ensued. Tension was high and the sudden sound of bullets whizzing through the air caused most of my comrades to run screaming into the woods. Some were cut down as they fled, but most managed to get out of range into the trees. I, however, remained in the brush, focused on one of the tank's doors, the one on the right pontoon. It seemed slightly ajar, and the tank was at just the right angle to where I could conceivably make it without attracting any machine gun fire. Sprinting quickly, I rushed over to the door, pulling it open all the way and rushing inside, knife in hand. I expected that I would need to grab the right pontoon's gunner and hold him hostage, in order to force them to stop firing. It didn't seem like an easy task, but I didn't much relish the idea of just tossing a grenade in and killing a lot of them. Deserters, perhaps even traitors they may have been, but I had no desire to kill any of my fellows. As soon as I jumped into the tank, however, I was met with a rather different sight than I had expected. Inside the tank, I was greeted by the stench of ash and burnt meat. Seven corpses were scattered about the interior, all horribly burned. The only living person was a young man in the driver's position, as soon as I looked about in confusion, he had grabbed me violently, wrenching the knife out of my hand and sending it clattering onto the floor. He punched me in the stomach, knocking the wind out of me and giving him a chance to draw his pistol. Nice try, Fritz. The driver spoke, gun aimed squarely at my head. But you won't be able to stop us that easily. We're going to continue our advance all the way to Berlin if we have to. Stuttering, I replied. What? What are you talking about, man? I'm on your side. A strange look crossed the driver's face, almost like he was trying to remember something before he shook it off and regained focus. 
So no you're not, you're clearly a German spy, trying to convince us to turn around. He looked off to the side as slightly as if listening to someone, before chuckling and saying, You're absolutely right, Johnson. He certainly isn't able to fake an English accent. I peered over to where the driver was looking only to see one of the burnt corpses giving a skeletal grin back at me, its lips seared off by heat. It seemed to be partially melted into the floor and was very clearly dead. You're absolutely mad, I exclaimed, looking around at the corpses in horror. Don't you realize the rest of your crew is dead? And the driver laughed. Dead? No, no, no. You Germans may have taken up the commander with that lucky shot of yours, but the gunners and I are just fine, and we're going to take the fight all the way to the Kaiser's Palace. As I was about to respond, suddenly I heard the rhythmic rat-a-tat of a machine gun firing. Looking around, I noticed one of the guns was aiming and firing itself, as if being manipulated by some invisible hands. Excellent shot, Fred exclaimed the driver gleefully. I noticed for the first time the rather large holes in the tank's armor, nearly six inches across, exactly where the commandeered German tank had struck the vehicle, which had saved me from oblivion only an hour or so before. I remembered the flames looking out from the rack, and I realized that it must have been impossible for any of the crew to have survived it. I looked back to the driver noticing how completely free from harm he seemed. There wasn't so much as a scratch or even any sweat staining his uniform. He seemed as if he had just arrived at the war straight out of training. There was something inherently unsettling about realizing that the man you were talking to was already dead. We've all heard ghost stories, tales of unquiet spirits walking amongst the living but to see one right in front of you, a man completely unaware of his own death. Still walking and talking as if he were alive, it's completely different. Why are you doing this? I asked, my voice shaky following my realization of what exactly the driver was. Why, to win the war of course. I won't stop until you have surrendered, till the war is won until we can finally just all go home. The driver was practically screaming, waving his gun around like a conductor's baton. It was then I realized what I had to do. You don't have to fight anymore. You've beaten us. You've won. The Kaiser just announced it. The war is over. I was sent to tell you that. You don't need to fight anymore. The driver's face seemed confused. We won. We did it. It's all over. I nodded, hoping this would work. The ghost, or whatever it was, seemed to think that I was a German soldier, so maybe it would believe me. Yes, it's all over. The fighting is done. You can rest now, you've done your duty for king and country, and now it's time to rest and you can go home. The driver lowered his pistol, staring off into space. For king and country, he whispered, eyes glazing over. Yes, for king and country, I said, trying to keep him talking. It's all over, you won, you served well with honor and courage, your nation is proud of you. A single tear flowed down the driver's cheek as he began to gently sway back and forth. After a moment, he once again murmured out the words, For king and country. As I watched, the young man's uniform began to darken and then crumble into ashes. His skin started to blacken as his eyeballs bursted. The vitreous fluid dribbling down his face only to evaporate into steam moments later. His hair started to fall out in clumps, crumbling into soot as it hit the floor. In the space of a few seconds, the once lively looking soldier collapsed into a pile of ash and bones. As soon as this was complete, the engine sputtered and then fell silent. I staggered out of the tank, dazed from what I had seen. I called out to the others and that it was all safe and that they could come out. Eventually, the other lads came out of their hiding spots and asked me what had happened. I didn't answer them, I just pointed to the open door of the tank as I began to march back out of the forest. I never heard an official explanation for what happened with that tank. I never went looking for one. I imagined the higher-ups just filed away the report of what was found there. 
The eight burnt bodies of the tank crew assuming it was some sort of mistake or a sick joke. My time in the war didn't last much longer after that final incident. A few weeks later, a stormtrooper gouged my eye out with a knife and that was that. I was sent back home with nothing but a medal and a missing eye to show for my time in the war to end all wars. I wish that I had some explanation for all that happened to me, that there was some common thread in linking these three events. But as hard as I try, I cannot find one. I've tried to convince myself that I was just barmy, that shell shock made me imagine these horrible things, but I can't. I know in my heart of hearts that my memories of these events are true and I cannot deny their veracity any longer. I'm going to hide this journal now that I've finished writing these accounts. After I die, somebody will find them and maybe the world will be ready to hear these stories. Maybe someone else will put together the dots and figure out what I could end. I only wonder how many others had similar experiences and like me, chose never to speak of them. That is the end of my great-grandfather's journal. I was unable to verify anything about the final tale, as there are no records of any friendly fire incidents at the battle that he described. However, it is true that such incidents are often underreported, and it is often difficult to find accurate records after over a century has passed. Alas, I cannot find any logical connection between my great-grandfather's experiences. I do not see a common link between them, nor any rational explanation for what he describes. My only theory is this. Perhaps when the world is racked with constant violence and pain, reality itself is wounded. Maybe when the whole world is drowned in blood, strange things awaken from the darkness to lap it up. When the whole world has gone mad, what does a bit more madness matter?